All right, guys. So sorry for the problems. About 15 minutes ago, I was actually watching YouTube doing some things and I hit live. Unfortunately, I think once you go live, you can't actually not be live. Anyway, I'm here. It's two o'clock for the May catch up, the May live Q&A. If you are watching right now and you can hear me and you can see me, just let me know in the comments below. All right, I see three people hit the like button and it looks like I've got four people right now. Oh, Robert Jackson, you didn't scare me. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here. Johnny, are you in Cuenca right now? How is your flight? Looks like we have six people on right now. So if you have just joined, please just leave a comment in the comment section of where you are watching this from. Oh, Johnny, you went to Manta. I thought you were coming to Cuenca, but I told you Cuenca, well, the blue skies are coming out now. It's been a little bit cold the last couple of days, so Manta might be the place to be. And Robert, where are you watching from? Tallahassee. I've never been there. Oh, Johnny, you're coming on Friday. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'll share all of that, but I kind of have, uh, I have some aggressive travel plans. Well, I had very aggressive travel plans. As you guys know, I, um, well, I have been, I'm in Quaker right now, but actually I had been traveling for, I think five or six weeks. Um, I'll get into a little bit of that, but I had to kind of hang around Quito for a while. So that's why you saw, um, I think I did a Latacunga video, Salcedo, uh, I did the Quito Huecas video. So during that time, I had to be, I just had to kind of be close to Cuenca or to Quito. And so uh, I didn't know how long I was going to have to stay there for. So we just kind of kept tagging in videos, but I was really happy that we were able to do the Quito Wakas video because I love Wakas. And then also the Latacunga video, I was shocked at how well it did. So Latacunga is just this really lovely town. I would actually call it a suburb of Quito because it's an hour away. And the, when I say it's an hour, it's an hour because of Quito traffic. It's just like on the end of Quito. And I really loved it, loved it so much. So we actually spent I think four or five nights there. And everyone told us that there was nothing to do in Latacunga. The only thing you do is you go to Cotapaxi from Latacunga or you go to Quilatoa. But the town is actually really quite lovely. I cut a lot from it. Andreas told me to make two parts of Latacunga. And I said, nobody cares about Latacunga that much. Well, I was wrong. It's actually one of the best performing videos. So I am excited about that. And I actually really want to go back. So I think the next video will be New things I discover and all the things I sadly cut from the other video. All right, let's see who else is here. Patrick is from Ontario. Oh, I didn't realize you're from Ontario, Patrick. I am from Nova Scotia, but I lived in Toronto, downtown Toronto for 10 years. Used to work in advertising. Hello from, from New Jersey, DK. Ah, New Jersey. Are you Ecuadorian? There are a lot of Ecuadorians in New Jersey. Uh, I think you are. I think we chatted about this. And then Amelia, yes, you're from, oh, Grim Staten Island. I don't know if that's the weather, but let me tell you, it has been rainy the past two days. I'm looking out my window and I can see some blue skies coming. So I hope that means the weather is turning around here. Ah, Shane and Tanya, thank you so much for joining. Guys, I haven't shared this video yet, but Shane and Tanya have their own video. They have retired in Olan on the coast. And so, uh, oh God, it, it feels like it was like two days ago. It also feels like it was like two months ago, but a few weeks ago, uh, we saw Shane and Tanya. They are also Canadian. So that was nice to check in with them. And they also hosted us because we landed in Olan on like the worst time of the year. So there was nowhere to stay and they really saved us. Jim Jensen from Alaska. Wow. That is the farthest. Unless 
Priscilla logs in today from London. So far, you are the farthest. And I love your sweater, but I'm dressed like it's freezing. Robert, I do have a sweater on. I also have on shorts. <laughs> like, I feel like that's what Cuenca is like. Like in a day, you get any kind of weather. Um, so I do have a sweater just because I find like when I'm working and doing stuff, it's like I, I just... I either put on a hoodie or a sweater or something, but then I also have shorts on and flip-flops. So I think that's really representative of the weather here in Cuenca. Uh, 85 in Florida. Ugh, that's too hot. So today I was just reviewing um, some edits for upcoming videos. And one of the videos, it had 86 Fahrenheit. And I remember how hot it was because one of the things you could do at this beach was you could go hiking. And I was like, I am not going hiking in this weather. I think the Andes is much better suited to hiking. And that's why you don't find a lot of walking trails along the coast. Ah, Raul from Texas. Thank you so much for joining. Ah, Patrick, Corey, Patrick's partner on here with him also. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks you guys for watching. Luis, do you think Ecuador is self-sufficient? Uh, let me see. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because so Maria and Pedro have asked me questions today. What we're going to do, normally I do a straight up Q and a, um, but because we have so many new people, Pedro, who just joined, um, who's not new, but we have so many people here that are new to, you know, me through the channel, but maybe you haven't seen some lives before. So I'm just going to kind of take you through like a reintroduction to me and like what my background is, why I'm here, because, well, if I were retired, I would either be a millionaire or just like look fantastic for retiring early. Um, but so I'm going to share a little bit about who I am, why I'm here. Um, and then in the last couple lives, I really skirted some issues of like my visa, why I've been in Ecuador for eight months. And then uh, I just, I've just had some stuff going on. So, and I haven't shared it. It's been like highs and lows. So I would say since the last live, there have been so many highs and that was visiting Esmeraldas. It was freaking amazing. I, I'm just so happy that we went there and did this. Um, I know there's a state of exception right now for uh, YS, Manabi and Esmeraldas, the places that we went to in Esmeraldas are not included in that state of exception. So um, one of the things that we talked about quite a bit in the video was that, yes, Esmeraldas, there are some, it's, it's the northern part of the coast. And so because of drug trafficking that happens between Peru and Colombia, lately, the government has been very concerned for good reason <laughs> um, of what's happening because they are seeing unprecedented crime that they haven't seen before. And that is not typical of Ecuador. Ecuador has never been a dangerous country and um, it doesn't really have any like foot in the drug trade, except it just happens to be between Peru where they make most of the cocaine and Colombia where is you know the, the hub for trafficking it. So um, everywhere that we went in Esmeraldas was safe. We felt fine, but you'll see if you saw my Tonsupa video, I was just a little bit uncertain. Andreas was a little bit uncertain too. And so we did things like we didn't go out at night. Um, and then we also really talked to locals a lot. And so when people said things were difficult or complicated, that meant like, don't do it. And so people were great. They also, there were things on my list that I wanted to do, their food that I wanted to eat. And um, when they said, no, you can't go there. But then they had other recommendations of places that we could go. So I just thought that people were amazing. The beaches were so beautiful. And I don't like to play favorites, especially if you are in Manabi. You might not like that I've said this, but the best food in Ecuador, hands down, is Esmeraldas. It took all of the traditional Ecuadorian dishes, like bologna, to this whole other level. Like once I had the bologna with shrimp, and I think I had it three times on camera, but more times not on camera. Um, it just ruined balloon for me because it's so good. And so I would say no matter where you are in Ecuador, if you say, see that a restaurant is um, an Esmeraldeña uh, restaurant or the cook is from Esmeraldas, like you got to go there if you're, if you don't want to go to Esmeraldas. But in general, the beaches that we went to, everything was very safe. We had no problems whatsoever. And I would be very honest with you about that because we were also concerned about that. And my goal was to try the food, but I don't believe you should risk your life 
to eat food. So for example, in Guayaquil, there are neighborhoods that I would like to go to to try the food. It's not safe. So I don't go there. So I would actually consider Guayaquil and Esmeraldas kind of very similar. There are places you should be, places you should not be. Just stick to the places you should be and you'll be fine. Um, and then so, Luis, do you think Ecuador is self-sufficient? So I will get to this with, as I said, with um, Pedro's question about the computer. And then Maria had some questions, I think, about just general fruits and vegetables and things like that. And so I would say, yeah, I would say yes. So um, I'll talk about my computer issue later on or my camera issue later on. But in terms of needing everything you want, things have changed quite a bit. So I would say like 10 years ago, expats were bringing in and even uh, Ecuadorians who went to the state were migrating back home, that migration process. Um, people were bringing in like containers and they were spending, you know, $10,000, $15,000 on containers. That's not really necessary anymore. Um, the price of electronics have come down, TVs, like everything might be a little bit more expensive than if you got it in the States, but um, you also don't have to ship it. So there are things that you can get a mule to bring in or shipping services or things like that. I personally think that's crazy. So unless you really love something, I would say just like give up Amazon. <laughs> If you have people coming in a couple times a year that you need spices or specific product, do it. But I think the reason why I'm so happy in Ecuador and in general, wherever I go, before I lived um, here, before the pandemic, I was in Cuba for two years. Like that is a place where sometimes you can't even get cooking oil and people line up for hours to get it. So for me, the perspective of uh, being Canadian, very fortunate to be Canadian, but having been in countries where like you can't even cook that really gives you some perspective. So Ecuador has everything I need. So, um, okay. I'm just gonna answer a couple more of these because I know that, um, well, I screwed up the live. And so hopefully everybody is coming over here. I just wanna check actually to see if I got any comments from people that are saying like, where are you? I tried to make it really obvious that I screwed up. So let me just check comments there. No, it looks like everybody is figuring it out. Maria, you made it. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Maria's got lots of questions and she always does, which is awesome. I feel like Maria and Pedro, I can always count on to have questions to fill this. Um, oh, and you did receive the oops message. Awesome. Okay, so as I mentioned, if you haven't yet, please comment below where you are calling in from or watching from. And then also don't forget to hit the like button since I really screwed up that first video. So what I wanted to do first off, it's 2.15, is just to give everyone a little bit of background about me. I think I did this in the first live, but I haven't talked about it since. So I am Canadian, I'm from Nova Scotia, and I'm 44, 45 next month. And uh, I moved to Toronto uh, in 2001, and I worked in advertising at an ad agency for 10 years. Really loved it, but I was in my early 30s. I wasn't really sure if I wanted to have kids or not. To be honest, I didn't want to have kids. I was just like waiting for that. Like, when does that like in maternal instinct come in? Like, I was just waiting for it to happen. And I mean, I was 32 and it still wasn't there. So yeah, I, ha I decided that, okay, um, I traveled a lot and I loved my job. And thankfully, I worked in a profession where um, you could kind of take a career break. I mean, you weren't, it, it wasn't guaranteed that you'd get your job back, but people, people accepted it because you work with a lot of creatives. I actually worked in marketing strategy and worked with creatives. And so um, I saved $20,000 to travel for one to two years. And I had never been anywhere in Latin America, but I knew I could travel Latin America for $1,000 a month or less. So I bought a one-way ticket to Mexico. Uh, WestJet lost my bag. I was stuck in Cancun during spring break. And that kind of set it all off. And so in 2010, I did not travel with a smartphone. Um, but I did start a website called Bacon is Magic. Let me just write this down because people think I'm saying baking like I'm a baker. But I don't like sweets. I do like pork. And so I started this website called Bacon is Magic, which started out as my just kind of travel diary of being somewhere where I didn't understand the language and I was traveling by myself and I didn't know what I was doing. 
Um, I had traveled before and I traveled solo before for vacations, like to New Zealand and Italy, but I had never gone to Latin America at all. And so uh, I had also ended a five-year relationship, <laughs> like at the um, airport security like we knew it was going to end, but like that was the end of the relationship. And so I spent a lot of time in Mexico crying on buses, listening to podcasts, trying to teach myself Spanish, um, met a lot of really wonderful people. I have such wonderful things to say about Mexico. People were very kind. And I would say as I traveled through Mexico and Central America, I was just um, so struck by how kind people were by a solo female traveler. I felt very safe. And to this day, I actually think that in many ways, single women are protected by the community um, in a way that, say, couples are not. So I met lots of people. You know, I would be in bus stations where women would say, come sit with me or, you know, people were very protective of me and I had a wonderful time. And then I hit South America, which is very different. I took a boat from Panama to Colombia. I got in Colombia. People were so friendly it scared me because <laughs> you would you meet people and after five minutes, they're like, oh, kind of my house, we're having this party. And I was like, oh my God, they're gonna murder me. Anyway, and then I got to Ecuador. And so that was in 2010. And Ecuador was very interesting because it's so different from Colombia. Colombia people are so in your face. Same thing with Brazil. They're like out in your face. They're like friendly and they're amazing. And Ecuador, I would say, is a little bit more kind of like Canadians, I think. like. Um, very friendly, but not in your face. And then I also find with Ecuadorians, you kind of have to be the first person to smile, the first person to initiate things. And then also I learned to now, which I really understand is in Ecuador, there's a sense of formality and how you greet someone and um, being polite that will get you so much further. And so I visited Ecuador, my sister, my mom came to visit me. My sister got robbed her first day in Quito. Uh, and then um, I came to Cuenca and I met the reason why uh, I stay here at La Casa Cuencana since uh, 2010 is because I arrived at night because the bus took so long from, I think I must have come from Quito. And um, I arrived at night and it was during Cuenca holiday, Independence Day. So there was nowhere to stay. So I was actually sitting out on the street, like crying with my backpack on, like or like whimpering. I don't think I was all out crying yet, but it was dark. I didn't know what was happening. Anyway, so I, um, Andreas's mom saw me and realized like this poor girl has nowhere to stay. And at that time, this place had dorm rooms. And so she asked people who were sharing a dorm room, but knew each, everybody, if they would mind if they gave the empty bed to me. And so they said, no problem. Those girls are actually now still good friends of mine. And one of them is married to Andreas's brother. So this is like a really, um, a really <laughs> like epic moment in time. And so I came back to Ecuador in 2011 and all of this I was writing about on my website. So my website, Bacon is Magic, was really about um, the process of learning Spanish. And I had always been really into food. And so learning enough Spanish to go to markets and, and restaurants and talk to people so I could write on my website was really the key for me. And so that has been my job for the last 12 years. Um, as I said, I was in Cuba for two years before the pandemic, and I've actually traveled all over the world. I've traveled, I went to Ecuador, but I traveled all the way down to Argentina. And then I've also been back to different countries in Latin America several times. I'm Italian Irish. I'm not Latina. I actually did a DNA test because I just feel so much for this culture that I thought maybe I would be also like I'm short. I feel like I have the same kind of look and I can pass in a lot of countries unless I open my mouth. Um, anyway, so I came back in September of 2021 because I really wanted to help. I've always felt that Ecuador is a country just like Costa Rica. It has everything Costa Rica has, like all of the natural beauty and environment. However, I don't like Costa Rica because it's really hard to find traditional food there. And that's because a lot of the small businesses have been bought by uh, foreigners. I'm foreign, so I don't have anything you know, I don't have anything against foreigners. I don't have anything against foreigners uh, buying and opening businesses. However, there's just something lost in Costa Rica. You know, I think what they're doing for the environment is amazing, but there's just a culture that's really not there. And so I've been there a couple of times and just talking to locals, it's like 
they agree with me. So I really feel like in Ecuador, you can have that beauty. Everything is so close. You've got the coast, you've got, you know, the Andes, you've got the Galapagos, but also if, even if you don't go to the Galapagos, there are a lot of things that I feel like I featured here that are just as amazing as the Galapagos. And Pedro just said, 33 people are watching, but only 18 likes. I hope those 11 people like the, this video before you go. Anyway, I decided that I wanted to um, really work on my YouTube video. I had been working on it in Nova Scotia over the pandemic, but I wanted Ecuador to be my first country. And, um, and Andreas was also not working. You know, one of the things that we forget about is, you know, all of these places that really depend on tourism. So not only is their family business these hostels, but he personally is a guide. And so they weren't working whatsoever. Um, and so... I decided I wanted to come here. And at first I thought I was only going to come for three months and I thought I would do one video a week. And then I just was really, um, I just felt like three months, one video a week was not enough. And so then I said, okay, I'm going to do two videos a week for three months. And then I thought, okay, no, I'm going to come back uh, because I did go home for Christmas. I'm going to come back. I'm going to continue. And then as many of you probably know, you can only stay here for six months total. So you get your first 90 days, and then if you want to, you can extend it on the 91st day for another $144. Um, Luis, biggest downside to living in Ecuador? I, I don't even know what that would be. For a Canadian using the U.S. dollar, that's tough because my dollar is only worth, my income is only worth 80 cents. Um, and Tanya, yeah, I could see someone was thinking you were Latina. Hi, Spen. Okay, so this is some of the juicy stuff, my Z visa situation, um, which I have not shared. I'm going to give you a very brief um, synopsis of what is happening with my visa situation because it's come up in almost every video and I keep saying it's complicated, I think. Um, but that was because it wasn't resolved. I was actually illegal here for two days. Um, but in... But one thing I will say, a video is coming. I have a video dedicated to all of this because this was actually a really difficult time. And I would say the last five weeks, the highs was Esmeralda's and the low was my visa status. And I cried more than a few times. Um, Fabian, no fui en Imbabura. Tengo los videos de allá. Yeah. Eh, de... Eh, hacienda... Hay una hacienda allá. Muy linda. Um, so as I said, the Lowe's was not, um, was this visa process. So in December, I was contacted by the Ministry of Tourism because they were launching this nomad visa. And they had announced they wanted to do this nomad visa in August. So I was telling everyone possible that I, I wanted to be the first nomad. Like I wanted to do this. I wanted to share with people because my goal has always been not like, hey, look at me and the cool stuff I'm doing. But I want to help people come here. I want people to be inspired to come here and to see the beauty and not just see the beauty that other people show you that's like expat life. Like I believe expat life can be, or digital nomad life can be Ecuadorian life. So that's why I go to the markets and go to all the wakas and things like that because all of that food is new. So I want to explain it to people, help them understand like, where to eat it, why I don't eat any seafood in Cuenca, um, and what they can expect. And, you know, like all of the condiments on the table, people are like, oh, Ecuadorian food is so bland. I know they're not eating it right when they say that because there is lime on the table for acidity. There's ají, so many different kinds of ají in Ecuador. Um, there's usually a number of different condiments. So I want people to feel more comfortable with that. So when they approached me about doing this, I said, yes, let's do it. I'm in. So I got all these papers and um, we were working towards this. And when I first landed in Quito after Christmas, we were supposed to, we shot some video and then we were supposed to get the process going. Well, guys, I didn't get my visa until uh, end of March. So it kept getting delayed. And so they wanted to have this big announcement and announced me as the first digital nomad. And so I, that's why I was kind of hovering around Ecuador, um, trying to do things around, uh, sorry, hovering around Quito, trying to do things. Um, and if you watch my Quito wake up place where I shared the hotel that is 
$20 a night. It's a great hotel, <laughs> but that's why I was there so much. Like we were literally just waiting for this phone call. Just one sec for coffee. Anyway. Um, da, da, da. So, okay. So Raul Luis, after I explain all of this, I'm going to go through comments. So just hold on to those. And if I don't get them, please ask them again. Okay. So in that, um, because I was the first digital nomad, they actually had really no idea how to validate that I should be here. So in our initial discussions, um, I told them about my website. So my website income was enough to make me valid. I think the minimum income to come here is $12.75 a month. So my website does make that. And then, um, so I also had my taxes from the previous years. So I wasn't really sure what to do. A lot of people with other visas use visa facilitators, but because this was a new process, we weren't sure how it was going to work. And so the Ministry of Tourism was also helping to be kind of that go-between between me and then also, I'm gonna call it the Department of Foreign Affairs. I know it's like the Ministry of Movement and Humanity, I think it translates to, but I'm gonna call it Foreign Affairs. Um, and so, we tried to like figure out how do I present all my papers um, so that they would be accepted. I was not worried about it because I knew that like one, I didn't have any kind of criminal record that I met all of the requirements. So it was just a matter of making it happen. But when I went into the Department of Foreign Affairs, you know, you see this office and you're surrounded by all these people who want to immigrate there and they all have their stories and they're so excited. But then I realized they're not excited. They're actually upset. And that's because it was the worst experience ever. And my immigration clerk was horrible. <laughs> she was so mean to me. And her answer was always no. And you would think that because I was this, um, th she knew that I was in this program to be the first person that the ministry, I was working with the Ministry of Tourism on this. I don't, I didn't expect special treatment, but I also didn't expect such horrible <laughs> treatment. And so we were in there several times and just trying to figure out how they wanted things formatted. They would tell me things weren't formatted the right way, but then not tell me how to format them. So in the end, um, they weren't ready to accept my visa or my application, even though it had been ready, but they didn't have it in their systems until two days after my visa expired. And so I was fined. I, I actually almost left Ecuador. And so it was a really dark moment. And, um, Andreas and I had just like lots of conversations of, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to stay? Like, should I just go to another country that accepts what I do and things are easier that will treat me better? So Ministry of Tourism was wonderful. And I think also embarrassed um, the migration office, actually, which find me. They also were very nice. But I until the very end, the very last day when I was crying in the office and the, one of the directors came. I just really had a horrible, horrible experience. So I am going to share a video about this. I'm kind of giving you the behind the scenes on this because I don't want that video to be me complaining about what a terrible experience I had, but for this video to be useful for other people who may be pursuing this uh, avenue because I'm going to share what I actually did. Um, and then also just to let people know that my experience, which was terrible, it wasn't reflective of me, of who I am as a person. Um, and so if they are also treated badly, it's not reflective of them as either. Um, but Ministry of Tourism is aware of it. I've given them, given them that feedback. And last week, someone else told me they tried to apply for it here in or over there in Azogues. And they also had a really bad experience. So that really pushed me to shoot that video this week because I really want to arm people with what they need to know to do this. All right. Luis. You thought Ecuadorian food was pretty flavorful. That's because it is. Anyway, so I am now legal here and it cost me a lot of money, a lot of money because my in um, foreign affairs, she kept getting more things that she wanted from me to get notarized. Notarization here is a standard fee. So it's actually not expensive to get things notarized unless you get like 100 pages notarized, which is what I did. Um, I have a really great notary in in Quito. Uh, they, I think they were called Notary 80. I'm going to include that in that video too. They were really lovely people that also helped. They actually, they helped me figure out how do I show ownership of my website? 
Like, how do I show my insurance and all of these things? So they were really wonderful. The only people I had problems with were the Department of Foreign Affairs. But, you know, government employees, that woman is not going to get fired. So I just, I just have to deal with it, move on and help other people with this process. So visa status, I am legal. Now, the funny thing about going through this process is I actually was only doing it to help Ecuador. So I really wanted to help through my channels promote that this was a good um, process for people. And I still do believe it's a good process for people if you do not have a university degree. I do. I should have gotten a professional visa. It would have saved me a lot of money and time. Um, but I had planned to actually leave Ecuador in this in April when my six months ended. And so I stay, I'm staying here until June 1st. And that's because the process for the visa took like six weeks where I wasn't traveling. I'd been planning to travel the coast since mid January. So um, we've been kind of catching up on videos. So, oh, Luis, you're trying to get a visa as a remote worker. So this is the visa that I got. So the Nomad visa is remote worker slash Nomad. So I'm going to shoot that this week, and I'm probably going to try to have it up for next week. Um, and I will share that with you to be, you just have to, your company doesn't have to be in the U.S., but you do need to show uh, your contract and how much money you make each month. If you make more than twelve seventy five, dollars and you fulfill the other requirements, which I will outline in the video, then, then you're, you're set. So, and then you said, I heard it's a cultural thing where you have to ask in order to get answers. It's not common for them to elaborate. I wonder why that is. No, that's not. Yes. Like if you're dealing with someone and you're asking them like some things, yes, you could have that. But in the end, Andreas was actually my facilitator. He came in with that, with me for everything. Um, the whole process was in Spanish. I could have done it myself. However, like at the end, the very last, uh, meeting where I cried, it was because he had actually, the director came over and he told the director my whole process for going through things and what I had done and how much money I had spent and how, like my goal here was just to help them. And they were just not treating me very well. And I cried. <laughs> so, um, the director was fantastic. He was like, okay, we do this, we do that, we do that. Uh, I think my immigration clerk was just being difficult, to be honest. I think it was, she was just a frown on her face. And it was just, I thought, honestly, I was like, I'm from Canada and she's treating me this way. There are a lot of people coming from other countries, which are not the Canada or the US. I cannot imagine how they are treated. It, I was sad for me, but also sad for the state of Ecuador wants people to contribute to their economy. And this is the one of the first hurdles they have to go over. Anyway, so that was my visa status. It was horrible. I spent a bunch of money I didn't need to spend because you get six months and I was already planning on coming back in September anyway. And so I spent, I don't, I've got to count it because it includes all of the hotels just to hang out. Um, I spent a lot of money on that to help them and they find me and I spent so much money on it. And I could have shot all of those videos and then come back in September like I'm going to do. So my plan right now, um, we are going on one last road trip. So I'm not even done finishing all of the videos from the coast, but next week or at the end of this week, we're headed to the Amazon and then also um, central Ecuador. And I really want to provide value for all of the audience and the subscribers, even when I'm not here. So we have been shooting up a storm. And in the next month, we're shooting 21 videos. So I'm shooting enough video that through the summer, um, I will still be able to share video twice a week. We have been, I haven't really, I don't know if anybody follows me on Instagram. It's also my name, Angelina. Um, the Y is silent in my name, Angelina. Um, but we have been, I haven't been on doing anything because we've been like sitting down with a calendar and trying to figure things out. And I think that's the side of my videos that a lot of people don't see is that one, Andreas does not work. He, well, he works for me at a, at a much cheaper rate for me so I can afford it. But, um, and we sit there with a calendar and we, and a map and we figure out where to go. What are the interesting things? He reaches out to his network of, um, of 
guides and people he knows in tourism, just things that he knows that are interesting and different. And then I also do the same. I'm, you know, I'm asking people on YouTube and I'm also trying to reach out to hotels and things that I think are interesting for people that maybe I could not afford, but I think that people would like to see. And so we try to minimize our cost and be the most effective. And so sometimes we travel and we shoot a video a day. I did that in the fall and I burnt out really badly. If you go back and look at my Mashpee videos, you'll see like, I'm so tired. Um, so this time we try to stay at least two nights in a spot, sometimes three, which is a luxury. And then I come back to Cuenca and it's just like at my laptop all day. And I don't say that to complain. I love what I do. I love this community of people who who love, love these videos. A lot of these places are me going back to places I already know. Andrea's going back to places he already knows. Esmeralda's was the toughest because I hadn't been there and he hadn't been there in 10 years. So when people ask me a little bit about like, have I lost weight because I'm eating the Ecuadorian diet and things, my situation here is so much different. But I choose to do that as a content creator. So my website funds our travel. It funds Andreas, the editor, um, everything we eat and all of that. Um, however, um, one of the things I did realize was, as some of you know, in Manta, my camera broke. And so I have an older phone. I have a Pixel 3 and I just use it as a phone. I don't really use it for anything else. And so um, when my camera broke and everyone kept saying to me, shoot with your phone, I did shoot with my phone. It's not very good. <laughs> So, uh, like, I have, I'm one of those people that has, like, a cracked vid, like, cracked screen and stuff, just because, also, I travel so lean, so I don't like to, I travel kind of carry-on only. This week, I'm also doing a packing video. I'll show you. In Ecuador, actually, I don't travel carry-on only because I have a carry-on only for cold weather, carry-on only for, like, the coast of the Amazon. But, um, but I realized at that point, when the camera broke, and I thought I was gonna have to like drop another grand after I spent so much money on that visa that I was operating too lean. So I have shot right now, I think 87 videos. We're gonna do another 21. And then I'm going to see, there's some things that I wanna, like some fun videos I wanna do to compare, like to use old footage, like all of the delicious things that you can eat with plantain. So um, there's so many individual videos that I could kind of put them together. But honestly, my goal is to really to serve people and and to share as much as I can about Ecuador, because I really feel that what is currently out there is a few cities like Cuenca, Manta, Salinas, Quito. And then sometimes you get a little bit of Vilcabamba in there. But it doesn't really share a lot with you. And so I want to show people that there are other places and what it's like and also um, to help people support local businesses. Because when you first come here, if you don't speak Spanish, it can be really overwhelming. And you probably just want to go places where only English people speak because that's an easy thing to do, especially in Cuenca. But then you're just living like your old life here, always speaking English all the time and you'll never learn Spanish. And so I really just want to encourage people by showing them like going to wake us and markets and things like those are easy things that you can do. And Ecuador is so much cleaner than other countries. So you can eat in markets and, and there is a level of understanding for sanitization and vegetarianism and gluten and all these things that makes it really easy. So that's kind of my goal. And I just like thrive on it. I love YouTube. So when I first started my website, that was my diary of the things that I was doing and people connected and started traveling places that I was going. And then blogging changed a lot. And um, I'm so thankful that that pays my bills. I'm very fortunate to be able to travel and to be location independent. But coming on YouTube has really rejuvenated how I feel about traveling and sharing. And I, it's hard to keep my blog going because um, I just want to spend all my time on video. And I do. You might notice that if you leave a comment or you message me on one of my social platforms that I get back to you right away or I try to find the answer for you or, you know, if you contact me and we're not in Cuenca, so Andreas can't, you know, send you on a tour or go on a tour with you. I do try to find like he will find somebody else that he knows that will give you a good price and is a good guide. So those are things that we do. We don't make a commission on it. 
but it's just because we want to make coming to Ecuador as easy as possible for people. And that's really kind of like what we're both about. So it's like we're exhausted and we're exhilarated. So I'm just going to take a look at these, some of these um, questions. Uh, uh, uh. Is it easier to apply for a retirement visa? So Janice, I don't, um, I'm self-employed. I don't actually, uh, I don't, um, oh my God, I can't even think of the words. I don't qualify. I don't qualify for a retirement visa. So on this, Shane and Tanya in alone, they have a retirement visa. Um, they also used a facilitator. So uh, I think that would be the best person to talk to. I am sharing this nomad visa process, but I don't want to be one of those people who's an expert on Ecuador. So I'm not going to be doing like apartment tours or um, like how to open open bank accounts. And like, I feel like there are other channels that do that, but what those channels don't do is they don't travel a lot. So I travel way more than anybody else because that's my passion. Um, I just love meeting people doing interesting things uh, and I love sharing it with people. And so I give my advice and perspective on, you know, people coming here and wanting to buy a home right away. And I tell them not to or property right away only because I've spent so much time here. So it's these eight months plus the five other times that I've visited. And then also because I don't have any foreign friends here. Um, all of the people that I know are pretty much actually through Andrea. So all of his friends. And then I do know Capture Joseph. He's awesome. But I don't, because I don't have a lot of time here because we're always moving. Um, I don't really hang out with the expats. And so my perspective on things is always stories other people tell me. And because Andreas works in tourism and his family works in tourism, he's just seen Cuenca especially changed quite a bit. And also he just hears a lot of stories that of people making mistakes. And so um, Pedro asked me some questions about, uh, you know, trusting people, especially foreigners. So I will talk about that at the very end. Um, in Manabi, there are so many beaches like Canoa, El Matal, Pedernales. Pedernales, I'm going to have a video on. I was editing like the last little bit of it today. Um, Kanoa, I spent time in 2013 and I loved it. The earthquake really, I was just really sad. I actually went there. I did not shoot a video. So maybe in the fall I'll shoot, I'll go back and shoot a video, but I found it really depressing. And also I kind of found it dangerous. Andreas didn't feel comfortable either. There was just a weird vibe. I did not like it. And so I didn't share a video about it. Um, Greg, where can I find Kui and Cuenca? So Greg, I would, you can find it at all the markets. If you've never had guinea pig before, I do have a video of the best place to have Kui and it's just outside um, Cuenca. It's a town called Wallaceo and it's, um, I think should be a UNESCO heritage spot for food. So they continue, like Kotakachi actually, to keep this tradition of a lot of uh, indigenous food, pre-Columbian food. It's just really fantastic food. And Wallaceo has so many great dishes. And in the market there, you can have kui. And Andreas doesn't like kui. I do. He doesn't like it. And he also said he actually loved it. So that is the place. I think it's worth going out there. I also have a video called The Artisanal Villages. That's one of Andreas's most popular tours. And Wallaceo is one of those towns. Um, so uh, 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 I'm just going to do a couple questions and then I'm going to talk about kind of my big news other than the fact that I'm leaving. I am coming back. I am coming back. Uh, so that's why we're trying to shoot a bunch of videos. So I don't have too much of a break. Um, when we get there, I'd love to take along sometimes and be your vegan friend, Jen, <laughs> to show how to find vegan food in hidden places. Jen, you know, I do try to mention where you can find vegan food. So a lot of traditional Ecuadorian food actually is vegan. Um, however, you do need to know some Spanish because I think people forget, you know, they'll say things are vegan. They understand vegetarian really easy, but vegan, sometimes they might cook things or they'll put like an egg on it. You do need a little bit of Spanish. Um, I'm actually have a, a post drafted on my site that I'll probably get to in July. 
um, to give people kind of the, the phrases that they need to know to be able to order. Then maybe when I come back in the fall, I'll turn that into a video. So I, there's in Cuenca, if you come to Cuenca, vegan is super easy. Right across the street from me, I featured. So I have a video on vegan food, five places for great vegan food. Right across the street from me, like everyone makes vegan food. Cuenca is super easy that way. A lot of people are vegan here. Yesterday, there was a vegan festival in one of the squares, but it was a 45-minute walk and it was raining, so I didn't go. Um, you can get the visa in your home country at an Ecuadorian consulate. Luis, yes. Actually, I would recommend you do that. So in the end, remember this whole thing where I was going to be like the first nomad visa? I wasn't. I was number three. And that's because they couldn't figure out what to do here with me. And so someone applied in Chicago and they were able to get the visa before me. I don't know what the number two is, but I'm the first in Ecuador. <laughs> so um, if anyone applies for that and they have problems, let me know because I think the Ministry of Tourism really wants this to work, to show people that you can travel here and work here. And that is the truth. You can travel and work here. That's what I do. But, um, you know, government departments, not everyone is as keen as they are. So the person last week that I found out was having a problem, uh, Ministry of Tourism actually contacted them because I said, hey, in this digital nomads Ecuador group, somebody's having a problem. So I hope that gets worked out. I would hate for Ecuador to lose people because of, Bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Oh, talking too much. Um, retirement is easy. Send us a message, please. Yes. I don't know retirement. Um, and then also, Luis, I would say to you, if you have um, if you have a degree, just get the professional visa. This is what I would do. Because also, I have to check my notes. But the professional visa, I know then after two years, you can, it can lead you to uh, permanent residency, but I don't think the nomad visa does because that's not like our our goal. Our goal is just to stay here so we can travel. Mm. Greg, I love Loha. I really wanted to sneak in another visit there before I went. There is a Facebook uh, page and a website called Life in Loha. And then there's Loha Tip Tours tip stores or tip tours, both of those are awesome. Like Loha also has like so many traditional things that I'm really into. There's one thing where they put a goat and they cook it in the ground, but they only do it on the weekend. So I, the last time I was there, I didn't get to do it. Patrick, how did I learn Spanish? So um, before I went to Mexico in 2010, I did try to take like a couple weeks at a community or like a night school type thing. And I, I did learn a little bit my second language is French. I took that through to university. So I think learning Spanish was the way of conjugating verbs was easy for me. But then after that, um, I, I just to be I, I think I've had like a week here and a week there, but it has really just been about I don't I'm only around people who speak Spanish, except for Andreas. He does correct me now. And sometimes we do Spanish lessons like on long drives, but actually being around him really hurts my Spanish. So when I was in Cuba for two years, nobody, none of my friends spoke English. There was no English at all. Um, and then in other countries, I've just been around, I think because I stay places longer, um, I just make a lot of Spanish speaking friends. And then I always tell them, please don't speak English. And if I say something wrong, Spanish speakers are so nice. If you don't say something right, they won't correct you. But I always tell people to correct me. Like there was one thing I had been saying for a long time, I think like 10 years, I just found out it was wrong. So I would rather learn. So right now I'm kind of in the phase where I'm learning how to say like I would have like the imperfect and the subjunctive, like if you had done this or I should have done this. And a lot of that is sometimes just I'll recognize that I've said, I say the same phrases all the time and um, I'll find out what that is. And then for Andreas to, I'll ask him how to say something so that I can say it. And sometimes when we go out, um, like he'll order and then I'll order and then I'll hear him say something. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to say it like that. So you kind of refine. I also watch TV in English with Spanish subtitles on Netflix, which I find really helpful. Luis, which country I will be visiting next? Uh, Canada. I'm going home for the summer. So as I said to you, the other thing that's been going on with this is like 
the major dump of having to put so much money into my visa, I'm going home to visit my family in Canada. Um, and I'm hopefully doing a bunch of work. So on my website, I work with different tourism boards and they pay me basically to create content ab- around them. So there are a number of um, destinations in Canada that are interested now that kind of travel is opened up there. So I'm hoping to do a bunch of work there, visit my family. Um, I have two nephews and I'm so excited to see them. And so uh, we're going to have a family vacation. I'm going to uh, try to catch up on some work and then just like hustle and make a lot of money because in the fall, I'll be traveling again from September to December. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, what's your favorite food? Mine is fried chicken curry. Wow. Brownies, cookies, cheesecake, pomegranate waffles, pretzels, legendary 3D gamer. Where are you from? Uh, my favorite food in Ecuador is a toss up between ensaboyado and ornado, which is the roasted pig. I love pork. I also love all the sides too, like yuca, potatoes. Everything is good here. Um, Maria, no problem. I really... I'm sad to leave Ecuador, but I have to, like, I I have to see my family. Um, So we will be visiting in September. Your vegan friend, Jen, would love to meet up. I'm learning Spanish. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yes. So Jen, I am going to, when I finish that blog post, you're coming in September, so that's fine. Um, I will finish the blog post and I'll put it up on the community. There, and so... There are a dozen more vegan restaurants. There's so many vegan restaurants here. I didn't know how people would really receive that um, receive that video, but in between our road trips, when Andreas and I come back, like we almost go on these like cleanses because we've eaten so much. Um, I don't feature food in general on my site that I don't like. So uh, sometimes we have to eat. We always share the food, but then we also bring like Tupperware. So we always have all this Tupperware with food. Um, but when we're done, it's like we walk every morning for an hour and do exercises, drink green juice and um, like, don't eat any meat. So I don't remember the last time I've been meatless, I think for 10 days now, just like salads and smoothies. Um, watching from Scotland, David McNeil, moving to Quito in August. Your videos have been so inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, so many beautiful things around Northern Ecuador. I love Northern Ecuador. It's beautiful there. I would not live there. I love Cuenca, but I love visiting Northern Ecuador. Luis, is it start, is it starting to get more affordable in Canada? I heard inflation has gotten as nutty as the U.S. Why is Ecuador insulated as a ransom? So Canada has a housing crisis. It's impossible to get housing. It's super expensive. I would say everything else is probably okay. I'm I live in Nova Scotia, or my family lives in Nova Scotia. I don't really. I guess I live here, um, but uh, I would say Canada. It's my only reference point. I would say Canada is pretty affordable except for housing, which is why when I'm not traveling, um, and I usually travel for most of the year, I go, I am the only reason I go back is to see my family or if I'm working with a destination. Why is Ecuador insulated? I think in general, Ecuador has been, is probably one of the most stable economies, even with all the crazy craziness going on right now. It's still one of the most stable economies. Um, A lot of money comes in from people migrating. Um, I really like that they are raising a minimum uh, wage here. I know some people don't like it because it makes things more expensive, but I think there's a vision for Ecuador. And that's why when people talk about it being an undeveloped country or a developing country, I don't like that at all because people here are very well educated. I think a lot of expats think they can come in here and they're going to get like a beachfront property for like $400 a month. There are a lot of really rich Ecuadorians. If there's prime beach like front somewhere, they bought it. So Ecuadorians are very smart. And also um, Latin Americans invest in real estate. They invest in land. So they buy houses. So they're less like North Americans where like we want to get a mortgage. Um, they pay for cash. They might get loans. Um, but their investment for their retirement is often in real estate. And there are a lot of really rich people here. So I think people think they're going to come here and like make it big. But this is a developed country with educated people. Um, A lot of people speak English, you know, hardworking people. So 
Yeah, I think that all contributes to, you don't really see people begging. There are Venezuelans that unfortunately have been, um, that have had to come here because of what's happening in their country. So I think a lot, if you see a, someone begging, it's very rare for it to be an Ecuadorian. Along the coast, you'll see Ecuadorian children like along the beach selling things, working with their parents selling things, but you don't really see them just begging. It, it's just a different cultural perspective. I mean, the Venezuelans who've come really have nothing. So that's a whole other thing. Um, legendary 3D Gamer. I don't have a favorite song. I kind of, in Ecuador, I do like reggaeton. Andreas hates it. And it makes driving really difficult. We both like 80s music, though. So we will listen to that. But I'm kind of like one of those people, whatever... Whatever's on. I do like reggaeton, though. I think it's because of so much time in Cuba. Um, so, Edison, how about a techni techie nomad queue? Oh, Pedro's going to love this. Do you tend to carry two laptops with you for all your work? No. I carry one laptop. So I'm going to answer this question for you and then also for Pedro right now because I had to pull up my computer to find out what it is. So I have an XPS 15-inch uh, 7000 series 7590 Dell. And I bought this, I used to travel with a MacBook. And then once I started getting really into video editing, I had to, um, I need to upgrade my RAM. And I didn't know that when you buy a MacBook, you basically have to decide what you want for like the next 10 years with this MacBook, because once you decide, like you can't upgrade. So I will never buy another MacBook again. So this Dell is fantastic. I think it was um, 16 megabytes of RAM, if that's something that's possible. I looked at the specs. And then I actually, I bought it with 16, and then I had a friend put in um, 32. And here, I did talk, Pedro had a lot of questions about just um, computers and stuff here. And so Andrea said, now in Ecuador, yes, you can buy anything you want here. If you want to buy like a new laptop if you want to buy a new computer. It will be more expensive than the US, but especially if you want to buy a desktop, you don't actually have to bring it in. Um, also, what I learned about my camera breaking was there really is a culture of fixing things here. So my camera, I took to, when it broke, I took to a Sony authorized dealership and they're like, no, we can't do anything about it. And then Andreas was like, no, we're going to, that was in Waikil. I cut my um, coastal trip short because I was so depressed about my camera. I couldn't shoot my kill. I was like, I can't do it with my phone. I was just, I was being a bit of a drama queen. I just did not want to do it. Came here, um, shot, we found a, a camera store and they fixed it. And so I think authorized dealers can only do authorized things. Whereas we took it to just in the historic center, this guy was like, oh yeah, I see what the problem is. It's the motor. I've got another camera that we're not using where I can take the motor out of that, put it in there. So the parts and the labor were $65. It doesn't sound the same. I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's working right now. So I'm very happy about that. And so when I asked about computers, Andrea said, yes, like you can buy here. It'll be a little bit more, but you don't have to pay for like a mule to bring it in. Um, I do travel with two um, hard drives. I thought I might have it around here, but I don't. But I do travel with LACI, L-A-C-I-E. It's either LACI or LACI, um, a five gigabyte, a two megabyte. And then I also upload everything to Google Drive. So I have things in the cloud. I don't think Google Drive is the most efficient. However, because I'm on a Pixel and I use Gmail, like it, it works well. So that's what I'm using for that. Um, Raul, I am planning to buy property in Ecuador. I did research about the property. Taxes is 180 a year. So Raul, I would just say, do not buy anything to everyone who's coming here. Stay here for a year because there have been so many nightmare stories of people who bought property and then realized like they'll never be able to build on it, especially if it's prime real estate. If no one's built on it or something hasn't happened, there's something that's wrong. And so I think a lot of people come here and they think, oh, no one has noticed like this is prime or this is going to be fantastic. And then unfortunately, later on, they find out that there is something wrong with the land or there's something wrong with the coding or there's something wrong. And they're like stuck with this land and gringos will sell them that land. So people come here and they're like, we can't trust Ecuadorians. They're going to try to gringo us. Gringos will try to gringo you too. And so the best way to learn how things work, if you're not from here, is 
to be here for a year. And then you see how things work. So I was in San Jacinto and there were some people there who were buying property and Cottages by the Sea, Kimberly, she's amazing, very frank. Um, she bought a place there and uh, also brought in a container, does not recommend it. And so told me a lot of things that she sees going on. Anyway, so these people, they got a real estate agent and the real estate agent told them that if they saw something for sale, not to call the number, but to give the number to them. That's not true. You can just call the number yourself. So I think if you stay here for a year, you kind of, things don't work the same way that they do in Canada and the US. It's not people trying to scam you. It's just different. So there are different ways of doing things. There are different um, levels, things that you'll have to do that you didn't realize there will be hidden costs there will be hidden processes. And so if you stay here for a year, you will save yourself a ton of money. I know everybody wants to come here and buy right away and start their new life, but like come here, get an apartment, like a house for $500 a month. And then also if you look at people like Shane and Tanya, they rented it and they're up to their uh, one year mark. But if you look at even the most famous of the Ecuadorian YouTubers, JP and Amelia, they lived in Cuenca and then they moved to Alon and then they moved to Manta. And then I think they're like outside Cotacachi right now. I don't know. They won't tell, but apparently that's the gossip. So they're on the fourth place. And I think they've been here, I don't know how long, but I don't think they've lasted much longer than a year. And that's not their fault. But when you come here and you visit and you think there's a place that's amazing, and then you realize like your neighborhood um, during rainy season, like totally floods, or that you've got like 25 dogs who bark throughout the night. And so a lot of people who come here, very few expats, like make it past the one year mark. And I think it's because they've locked in. And if you buy then you've got to wait for like another foreigner to come in and buy your place because you probably spent too much money on it. So somebody else needs to come in and make the same mistake you did to break even. And that like could take up to two years. So that's my rant on that. Personally, personally, I would never buy. So I think if you know what you're doing, like Andreas's family, his mom is very smart. She's made investments that have paid off like 10 years later. But if you're retiring here, um, real estate does not appreciate like it does in Canada or the US. And you can rent here really nice places for pretty cheap. There's no way like a mortgage here, if you want to get if you could even get a mortgage, is going to be really expensive. And then you're just going to pay until you die. So I would rather rent and then find out rainy season is terrible or there are too many mosquitoes and then move. I'm like, ciao, see you later. But that's just me. I think owning, especially later in life, is a very North, like North American concept that I, I don't buy into that. So, okay. I am going to, Pedro, I'm going to answer some of your questions because I put yours to the side and you asked me first. So Pedro asked me a question that made me laugh out loud. He said, if you still worked for a company and liked it, but wouldn't allow work from Ecuador, would you invest in more time seeking a new job or find best ways to show Atlanta virtual mail address and VPN? That made me laugh. I can't tell you what to do. What if you get caught? So I would say two things. Um, I use Express Express VPN. It is so I use Express VPN, and I'm going to get rid of it because it's like I'm paying a lot, and it's much more dynamic. Yeah, Express VPN. It's way more dynamic than I need, but it's a really great VPN. And so I'm actually thinking of moving to Surfshark because I've watched YouTube videos and everybody seems to love it. Um, but also it handles like multiple devices and it's cheaper. And I really only need it to do things like if I'm in Cuba and I want to go on like Expedia and book my flight, I can actually do that with a free hotspot, but I'll probably... My plan is to try out Surfshark, but ExpressVPN is more dynamic. I would actually contact your like that VPN and say, here's what I want to do. Would, could I do that? You do run the risk of being fired. <laughs> so um, I would also look for a job at the same time. So do both. And then maybe you'll find another job that you love. That's an amazing opportunity. I can't believe, honestly, I don't know what you do, Pedro, but I can't believe there are people who oppose remote working after the pandemic. Because I think we all showed that we could keep the world going with everybody at home or in another country. So that was your first question. That made me laugh. You also asked me, you mentioned a common mistake newly 
arrived expats make as trusting seasoned expats offering help? Are you able to share any sketches uh, of potential examples? I would just say anyone who wants to, like, there are a lot of people here who make a living off of referrals. I do not. Um, and that's how they make money here, even though they're retired. And so I think that they don't give you the best advice. And so I very lately on the Facebook groups, I've seen uh, people getting ripped off by real estate and things like that. So if you wait a year, it just, it just gives you more perspective of maybe that person who seems like they know everything and can get a really sweet deal for you. It's not such a sweet deal because you meet a, a bunch of other people who are like, oh yeah, that's Swampland. So I would just say, I always, there are people that I trust and then I, there are people I always kind of keep to the side. Like, I like you, but I'm not going to trust you until you prove that. Whereas I think a lot of us come to a different country and um, it's like another expat. So you think, oh, I can trust you because you're one of us. But no, nah, that's not true. Ecuadorians are generally very honest people, hardworking, honest people. There are some scammers, but I would say the same amount of scammers as expats that are here. When I'm editing videos, minimum processor size. So as I said, I think I have a 32 megabyte. It works. I use I use Adobe um, Premiere Pro, but as you know, I don't do all of my editing now. I have an editor because for me, to, I taught myself how to edit and I'd used Lightroom and Photoshop before, so Adobe felt like good for me. Um, but it takes me like two days to edit a video. And if I'm shooting two videos a week and editing two days a week, and then planning and then traveling. Like I can't do that. As it stands with an editor, I am like maxed out. Could you buy a replacement PC? Yeah, you could. So I, I hope Pedro that that was clear. I'm happy to also, if you have like really specific questions about computers and stuff, um, you can leave a comment and I'll ask Andreas because he knows better than me. Um, are you just better off getting residency permit instead of citizenship? I don't know the benefit of citizenship over residency. So everything I want to do, so I have temporary residency right now. I won't be able to go for permanent residency, but also even with temporary residency, the only value I can see is I get a cedula and I get deals at super maxi. And then actually theoretically, because I have a cedula, I have the same rights as an Ecuadorian. But in practice, I don't, even if I stay here, like when this two years is done and I get another two years, I don't see what, I don't have anything I need to do that I would need to be a citizen for. So the way Ecuador works is when Correa came in, he really wanted Ecuador to be an open country so everyone is welcome. And so everyone pretty much has the same rights. And that's why when you go to a museum or something, even there, they don't have like rates for uh, foreigners versus locals. So I think you do see that maybe with the airlines, but anything that the government runs, it's the same rate. Even though, to be honest, I think we should be charging tourists more um, or at least making it like free for locals and tourists a, a minimal price. Most of the museums here are free anyway. Um, Luis, it is cheaper to rent than buy. I know. I just, I don't know why people like need to buy. You can rent like whole houses for many years, do things to them. All over the world, there are renters. It's only North Americans who like outside of Mexico, because in Mexico, you also can rent. So it's only Canadians and Americans that are like so intent on buying. I'm, I'm never going to buy. I'm not even going to build you build and then you've got to wait for contractors and that's not just here that's in i had a contractor in um toronto it was a nightmare okay more techie edison um tv with hdmi okay so edison all of the tvs almost all of the places that i go have smart tvs so you can like here at the casa quincana they all have smart tvs Almost all of the places that we go have like Netflix, all of that kind of stuff. You can mirror to it. So you could do that. You could use that as an extended monitor. When I'm not featuring like expensive places, my general budget for us is $20 to $25 a night in a hotel. So I don't care. And that's why sometimes I don't share where I'm staying. If I'm sharing where I'm staying, like in Tonsupa, we paid for that. 
Um, if it's awesome, I will share it because I think it's a really good price. But lots of times we just stay in like whatever $20 a night places because uh, I'm not, but even those $20 a night places, like the place I featured in the Wicca's video in Quito, they have Netflix too. Like smart TVs are just kind of how it's, it's going. So if you don't have a smart TV, it's usually they don't have a TV at all. Um, Amid, I really want to go to Turkey. I really, really want to go. It is on my list. I've wanted to go for a long time. The food there, I can't wait to try it. It is on my list. Um, keep this. Uh, advice for real estate investors. Yeah, you need to know a lot to be aware. There are, there are a lot of scammers. I just feel like the longer you stay here, the more you become aware of what prices are and how things work. And you hear stories of how other people got scammed. And so renting... If you really want to buy a year renting will save you a lot of money. It really will. And Shane and Tanya agree. So I feel good about that. Um, all right. I'm going to do a couple more questions. And then I want to talk about something that I, I've been really nervous to announce all week. But I've been working on it really hard. And so I hope you guys like it. So um, how... Much time does it take to get adjusted to the altitude and local microbes? What should I expect to be sick? So, Greg, I can talk to the altitude. When I was here in Cuenca, I usually give myself a week. So if I haven't been here for a while, like, it'll be a week of, I don't get altitude sick. I think so many groups on Facebook talk about, like, oh, I couldn't deal with the altitude, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know what portion of the population actually has a legitimate altitude problem. But I think people overstate it as a reason why not to come here. So I did feel tired when I got here. You do notice altitude when you go places. But after a week, I'm pretty good. So I'll be out and about and doing things. But I'll also notice I'm tired. You do need to drink twice the amount of water you normally would. So you always have to constantly be hydrating. In terms of microbes, like I drink the water in Cuenca, no problem with it whatsoever. But I think when people come to a different place, yeah, like you, your stomach is sometimes upset and it's not because it's bad bacteria. It's just different bacteria. Um, I travel all the time and I, like I eat everything. And so I think I have built up like this iron stomach. I've only been sick once and it was in Cuenca and Andreas swears it was at a brewery we went to. And so if you go to a brewery and you drink draft, um, I once went to a restaurant in Toronto. You have to clean the the lines between the tap and the keg. And that is supposed to be done at most once a month. Really, if a place is busy, it's supposed to be like weekly or bi-weekly, but at most once a month. And that's because like bacteria builds up in those taps. So a lot of people will drink draft beer and then like, you know, you don't really feel so good about it. Um, that's the only time I got sick and that was the next day. That was terrible. We've never been back to that brewery. <laughs> So, uh, but I would say you might get sick. I always travel with Pepto-Bismol. I think five years ago, there used to be a sponsor of mine. I went to India and I would just eat like one Pepto-Bismol in the morning just in case. And I never got sick there. So, um, Luis, you love Surfshark. Your only problem ill is the bandwidth. Oh, okay. So that's good. So yeah, I, I do want to try that. I just been lazy slash too busy to do that. And if I do retire to Ecuador, there's also the effects of bugs during the rainy season. So there are bugs in some places, not bugs everywhere. Um, in the highlands. Okay. So in my videos, and I think the ones you'll see up the co coming up and along the coast, you'll hear me talk about mosquitoes. Um, a lot of the forests are being cut down for cattle. And unfortunately, cattle brings mosquitoes. And so Andreas was saying there are some places that we've been where you don't like the altitude is so high, you don't see mosquitoes. Like I never see mosquitoes in Cuenca, but there's some places that we've been that where you shouldn't see mosquitoes, but there's cattle and now we're starting to see them. So um, beef here is terrible. And I've actually decided when at all possible, I'm not eating beef here anymore. Every once in a while you get some good beef. Like I had some good beef at El Porvenir in another place, but I just feel like Ecuador offers other um, other forms of meat that don't require clear cutting. 
So I'm going to stick to those things. Um, and I don't judge anyone who still wants to eat it, but just the, as we travel more and more, we see the effects of what cattle ranching is doing. And it's really sad because when you cut down native trees, uh, they don't grow back. So that means the birds go, everything else starts to go. Like all of these things that are really special about Ecuador. I mean, I love a burger, but I don't, I can wait. I don't need to eat or like maybe only eat beef. Like when I know it's going to be really good. So, um, Legendary 3D Gamer. I have watched Doctor Who. I'm actually, I've always been like a big sci-fi kind of person. I love that kind of stuff. Um, me too. You live in Guayaquil. I really love if I can understand you, but I don't have subtitles. How can I do it? Me too. Um, on the replay, there will be subtitles. I do subtitles for all my videos because I want them to be accessible to also my friends who don't speak English. So in the live, I'm sorry. But when this is done, I will do the transcription and they will be up in a couple of hours. Um, Brits love to buy, which... There are, oh, and me too. Also, there are so many amazing Ecuadorian YouTubers, much bigger than the English ones. I actually watch more in Spanish than I do in English because they also know really great places and it's good for me to listen to my, to listen to Spanish. George, what do you need to go back to retire? George, I don't know. If you're Ecuadorian by birth and you have citizenship, you should just be able to come back, I think. But again, I don't know. Um... Kita says you can't rent anything decent for less than 3000 Toronto became that way too. So my last apartment I rented in Toronto for 1700 I lived downtown. And the only reason it was it was so cheap was we were right next to a, um, like a bar restaurant type thing. So it was super loud until like midnight. But because I was self-employed with my website and uh, we had a restaurant, which I'll talk about later, um, the, we got like a deal on the place. Greg, oh my God, what brewery? So I will tell you this, if you're planning to come here, there are like defamation laws and libel laws. And so you cannot say anything bad about a place. Don't say it on Facebook. Don't, uh, like you can't say anything bad about anyone. They can sue you and they will win. So if you want to know, Greg, when you come, before you come here, send me a message. So uh, you can find my, um, on Instagram, I'm also at Angelina. And so I will tell you there, but I can't say anything bad in public. I don't want to be sued by them. Also, I can't prove it. Andreas felt sick like immediately. And then the next day I was like, oh my God, my stomach is really bad. And we were actually shooting a video and I had to stop. I'm like, I got to go home. It's so embarrassing. Um, okay. So guys, the last little part about this, that, and then I'll go to some more questions because Maria's got a lot, is... As you know, I have put so much time into this. So my website was a full-time job and now I've been doing YouTube and it has become a full-time job. And it was at first taking up a lot of time, but actually now I don't have time, enough time to do both really well. So I have not worked on my website, which actually pays the bills for my videos in months. Um, and so at this point, this channel is getting to be a little bit unsustainable and I am monetized, but YouTube monetization, when you cover places like Ecuador, they doesn't bring in as much money. So if I had a channel about the US or Canada, I could make like lots of money. But once you decide to cover a country that a lot of people don't cover, it's not good. <laughs> so I can get lots of views. And then it's like, oh my God, that made me like $4. So um, my goal was to be monetized and then also to be able to pay for my editor. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm launching a Patreon. So I'm going to share the link with you. Oh, my mom just got here. This shows she doesn't love me that much. She's almost at, she's like an, over an hour late. All right. This is my Patreon. And so I gave myself a year to, to really be able to do this well and to be really committed to this community. And really, I'm kind of here 24 seven for all of your questions. And I do these lives because, you know, I want it, I want to inspire you to come here. 
But I'm also realizing I'm trying to inspire people to come here. And meanwhile, my savings are like going like this. And the rate that YouTube is paying me is just not, it's it's not happening. So over the summer, I will be going home trying to hustle to make enough money to fund um, the work in the fall. But I need to find a better way that I can actually serve the community, provide more information, but also make it sustainable so that I'm also not stressed about things like in the production process that things are too expensive or I can't share things with you because it like the cost would be crazy. Um, and so the other thing I realized was in order to really do well on YouTube, you have to find really broad topics that everybody covers and that people will search for. And that I really want to share the most interesting parts of Ecuador with you. And that's not always something that people are going to search because they don't know about like if I wanted to go to Pakistan right now, I could probably get a million views, like a million subscribers and make a living on YouTube. But I don't want to go to Pakistan right now. I mean, maybe I will someday, but I I want to share Ecuador with you right now. And so I have big plans for this channel and this is the beginning. And I think I can make a community where we can really share things that you can trust. I don't have to do what other people do by making money off referrals or um, trying to make a business of selling expats real estate or, you know, all of those things. Um, I will be traveling to other countries, but this will be my base. And so my plan is to always have like the core of this to be Ecuador and then also to share other places with you. So I'm not going to say where I'm going in September, but it's a new country. I've never been to it. I don't speak the language. Um, and then I'm going to a friend's wedding and then I'm coming back down to South America. And so you can expect more Ecuador content. And then I'm also looking at, um, maybe branching out a little bit, doing some in Colombia and some in Peru, two countries that I visited, but I've never shared, um, videos on. And so this Patreon, I really looked at, I've been researching for a while at how can I give people more of me? Um, while also being able to make this sustainable. And so the Patreon levels, as they're set up now, there's a number of different levels. Um, and then I put in base kind of rewards. They have that reward system. But as the community kind of comes together, we can work out what other things are needed. So I've put some things in that I think people will like. But we've also talked about things like um, creating downloadable guides and written things or things that I don't share in my videos of like how to do certain things, like how do things work? Things that I know but don't belong in travel and food, but are very specific that people are looking for that information. So that is the link. I hope you check it out. If you don't want to contribute to Patreon, do not worry at all. I am still going to do two videos a week, but I've just realized that I feel like we've got a good community on YouTube, but I feel like we can also build one off of it where we share the resources, we share the information, and I can share with you things that don't belong here. Pedro, thank you so much for your super chat. That is really so kind of you. I actually, one of the things I thought about in... Um, in Patreon was when I fixed my camera, Pedro had said, could you do a quick video on where you got it done and the process? And so that doesn't belong on this channel, but it could belong on Patreon. So Patreon will be a community where I share like behind the scenes, um, more Q and A's, specific information, travel plans, like all of the things that aren't officially videos here, but I can share those things with you. Also, um, for example, on Tuesday, I'm actually going to get this mole removed. So uh, that doesn't belong as a YouTube video. <laughs> but I think we're going to film it anyway, because I went to a dermatologist, just the process of going to a dermatologist and getting it removed. In Canada, I couldn't get an appointment for a dermatologist for two years. In Cuenca, I got it same day. And this was a surgeon. And so she had, I went in, I had a consultation. I actually had her look at all of my moles. We talked about um, just the health of my skin because there's so much radiation here. She gave me a bunch of products and advice for radiation in Ecuador. And then I said to her, hey, like, do you think you could remove this mole? Because it's kind of, I don't know, like as I get older, it's getting bigger. Like, I don't know what's happening. I guess that's aging. But she said, yeah, you can come in on Tuesday and we'll remove it. It's $40 an appointment, including like the anesthesia or whatever, the freezing and for her to do it. And then it's going to be done. 
So those are things I would like to share um, because I thought it would be a hard process, uh, like getting dentists. I've gotten gla glasses here. Like all of these things I think are kind of useful for people to know, but I, I'm not going to make a whole video of getting a remote, like a mole removed. That's kind of, it's kind of a, not embarrassing, but it's too personal. And then also, as I said, you have to be careful about what you say. So I do have opinions about certain things and I try to be really fair and balanced on YouTube, but I do have strong opinions about some things. And so I feel like that's better suited for Patreon for you to hear maybe some of my opinions that, I don't know if they're not popular, but I just kind of keep them to myself. Um, okay. My mom says she has a life too. That's why she doesn't care about me enough to join us live. I have to say my mom is amazing. So when I quit my job in advertising and I decided I was going to just travel for a couple of years and I didn't speak the language, she thought I was crazy, but she still supported me. And in fact, in 2010, she came down to visit me with my sister. And that's when my sister got robbed. But my mom didn't. She did get vertigo, though. Uh, see, lots of these stories I could share. Um I hope I don't pronounce your name wrong. Reese? I know it's one of those names that it's pronounced differently than I think. Anyway, about Cuenca. And Reese, okay, so Jordan from Tangerine Travels did get his mole removed. And i had been wanting to get a mole check for a while because I do tan, I can tan, but... Um, I, do, I have gotten a lot of sun damage. And so when I saw Jordan from Tangerine Travels got his mole removed, I immediately said to Andreas, we have to make the appointment. I said, Jordan, I said, Tangerine guy got his mole removed. So Cuenca looks like a great place, but it seems depressingly cloudy. What's your take? Okay. So I think Cuenca, for me, because I like art, culture, it's not a, it's technically a city, but it's more like a small town. I'm in the historic district and it really feels like a small town, but there's like tons of like free, like music events and art events. And there's always something going on here. And I love that. As I said, before I started traveling, I lived in Toronto. So I'm really much like, I want to go out and eat and do things. And, and Cuenca has the best food for the price. Like um, the Amuerzo series that I'm going to have coming up shares with you. Like you can eat a three course meal for lunch for three fifty. Really good food. Um, it also keeps the tradition, but it also has modern places. Like for me, Cuenca is the best lifestyle. But I'm not gonna lie. The sun's out right now. In the span of a day, it'll get sunny and cloudy. What I do like about Cuenca is also. Um, so Johnny right now is alone. And I told him there's a direct bus between Cuenca and alone. Alone is on the coast. And so I feel like, again, I would rent a place, but also I'm close enough that if I want to go to the beach for like a week or for four days, that I can do that. And so a lot of people from Guayaquil, it's really, really common for them to come to Cuenca, which is three hours away. Um, uh, for all of the festivals and things, just because there's so much that goes on here. Also, it's safe. So for me, this is it. I love the coast. I love being on the beach. I'm from Nova Scotia, but the coast would bore me. Like it just, I, I love visiting. I have such a good time, but it's humid. I had heat rashes um, and there's so many bugs. And so I, it's like, I go, I enjoy it. I come back. That's how I feel about it. Um, Is there any particular activity that has contributed to the most sun damage? So for the last 12 years with my website, I've spent most of the time in um, sunny destinations. And also I wasn't wearing a hat. So I now have hats. You have to wear a hat in Ecuador. If you're like me, you got to get over it. Like you just have to start wearing a hat. And so when I went to see her, she gave me um, some crayons to use. You have to wear at least 50. She really wants me to wear... Um, she gave me links to like UV, um, UV clothing and specific things to like very specific lotions to use. See, like this, this is a, like a really good topic that would be, I could use in my Patreon. I could just make a small, we could do like a Q and A or a small video where I share um, all of this because she gave me some really great information. She's Andreas's dermatologist, and I really enjoyed talking to her because. 
I'm 44 and I'm actually quite lucky. Like I haven't had a lot of sun damage in my life to be hundred percent transparent. I do have Botox and I need to get a little bit more right now, but, um, but I do look young for my age because I've always worn sunscreen. So I wear sunscreen first thing in the day, but like, I've got like some sunspots and things that I think just happen as you age. And so she showed me what I had now and then what it'll turn into. I was like, Ugh, okay, I don't want to, I don't want that. Um, Yes, Kitas, no. So yeah, they start growing. So I had some sunspots that had a regular, a regular um, color and then a regular kind of shape. And so I was very worried about it. And I went to my, to a clinic in um, Canada and they just said like, you're going to have to wait for two years. And I said, but I think I'm high risk. And so she told me you are at high risk and here's what we're going to do to take care of it. So I want to do that. I don't want, I know people who have had skin cancer. I don't want that. And like from a vanity perspective, I also don't want to look like I have a leather face in 10 years. So how's the drive from Manta to Cuenca now? Um, I think it's okay. I told Johnny, I told you about that bus. I don't know if you saw that. There's a bus. There's a direct bus from Manta to Cuenca. And if you don't know how to get there, leave a comment in um in the comments below and I'll ask Andreas what it is because he knows what the service is. I don't know what it is because we drive everywhere. Uh, Reese, have you been to Buenos Aires? Yeah, I have. It's dangerous. <laughs> like, so it's super complicated. Um, I, I, the last time I was there was 2010, 2011. Last time I was there was 2011. So I will give that as a whole thing. But everyone says like Buenos Aires, it's like the Paris of South America. It is, it's beautiful. But they also, at that time, I think was the beginning of their economic crisis. They're in such a crazy economic crisis now that they actually have like a street currency, which is US dollars, where you can get everything for half or you can use the regular currency. It is not stable. So again, I think it's a great place to visit. I spent two months there. So I rented an apartment. And again, I think that's the way you got to go, like, don't lock into a place, like go to Buenos Aires. If you think like, come here, if you think this might be good, go down there because flights are not that expensive. Um, spend a couple of months there, rent a place and you'll see just the difference. So I really loved my time there. I actually thought that I was going to stay there, but then I went back to Canada and realized, Oh my God, like I can wear headphones while I walk and I don't have to worry if anyone's going to rob me. And so Buenos Aires was a place where, I had to hang out with expats because they have a really insular um, society. And so people would be very friendly, but it was like really hard to make friends unless I was trying to date someone. That was like my only opportunity to really spend any amount of time with um, locals. And so there was a big expat population when I was there, but they were slowly starting to leave because just the uncertainty with the economy. Again, that was 2011. So take that all with, it could have totally changed. I don't think so based on, YouTube videos that I watched from down there, but I would say Ecuador, definitely more stable economy. Um, and then there are a lot of cities that are safer and probably have a better quality of life. Uh, Johnny, thanks so much. I mean, I, I'm really, I worked on this Patreon all week trying to find things that I thought I could provide value with because lately I'm getting a lot of messages with questions and I want to help people like, when people need to have a guide somewhere, Andreas can provide that information, but it, like it takes, it's taking all of these, this time. And then just questions for families that want to know things. Um, I, I really do want to provide that because I feel like you can count on the advice that I give you because I don't, I'm not making any money off of it. Like we don't make affiliate money. We don't get referral fees. So I hope that Patreon could be something that we build together. And then if people want different things, um, then we'll add those. And so the first goal, if you go to my Patreon page um, that I've added is for $500 in addition to the YouTube revenue that I make um, would pay for my editor. And so with that, once we get to that, we'll unlock a new, um, a new level because that means that $500 I can actually invest in not spending like so many hours trying to find like affordable, but not sketchy um, accommodation or not like taking 35 hour flights because uh, I need to have like the absolute lowest 
flight uh, cost, those kinds of things. When you don't, I'm, I lived in Toronto, but my family lives in Nova Scotia. And so flights, it costs the same to fly from Guayaquil to Toronto as it does from Toronto to Halifax. So all of these are things that kind of also add to just like the time and me trying to um, figure out a way. I love YouTube. I really do. Like I want to do YouTube. I want this to be it. I love this community we built. I love that people are going places that I've been to the little wakas and saying they really enjoyed it because that gives people a local experience, but it also helps local Ecuadorians, like these family owned businesses. And so I feel like I uniquely can offer that in Ecuador, but I need some help. Like I need help in providing that value, but I feel like I can, it will be worth it. I feel like I can provide it and it will be worth it. So that's why I'm offering this. I'm not just saying to you like, Hey, can you give me money? Because I don't want to run out of money. I'm actually, I want to give that value in return. So Amelia already signed up for my Patreon. Oh my God. Thank you so much. <laughs> it means so much to me. It really, really does. It is monthly. So if you do not feel like if you want to sign up, you don't have to sign up for a year. If you do not feel like you're getting value, then you can always you can always quit. So, and I'm also open to feedback of what people want. So I want this to be like people feel like they're getting something out of it. Um, yeah, I, I have all of this knowledge that I can't. Our videos now are over 20 minutes. And so I, like I'm running out of time in videos, but there are other things I want to share with people. So. Um, Johnny, you're using a driver. Oh, I don't know how long it takes. Um, Google, I'm, I hate to say this, but if you Google map it, it'll tell you from Manta to Cuenca. I, I'm really bad with ge geography in, in Ecuador because Andreas drives everywhere. I am getting much better at saying, oh, we drove by this a couple times. Uh, George. Yeah, like I just find... Cuenca is a cultural city. It's a cultural city that has kept its tradition. And I love that. Like I am all about, I haven't been to a lot of the um, like international style restaurants just because I feel like local food here is really good. It's very clean. Um, there's a lot of pride in it. There's a lot of pride in local tradition here. There are a lot of free concerts. You can learn a lot about Ecuadorian culture here. Um, it's just really special. So that's why I think I would always base out of here. Also, I know Andreas. So it's like, I always have that connection. I have his friends. I I know the city very well. I've been here and I've spent so much time here, but I always love the coast. Like I love visiting the coast and then Northern Ecuador. I think the beauty there is unparalleled. Northern Ecuador just has views that I, I think probably because they're not cutting down the trees for cattle yet. So, um, Oh, I'm happy to answer all of your questions. In Ecuador, there's a higher risk for skin cancer because sun rays are direct. Yeah, like the dermatologist actually explained that the it's not just radiation, but it like gets deeper into your skin. So I've always been, I use a very expensive sunscreen. Um, and when I showed it to the dermatologist, she said, yes, that's good. But she said, now you've got to also put that like same level of sun care on the rest of your, your body. So, um, I have not been to Uruguay. And so when I was in Buenos Aires, I actually wanted to go and I haven't. So I do want to go in South America. I've been to Brazil, Colombia, Peru, um, Chile, just the North. Um, and then Buenos Aires. And even in Argentina, I spent a lot of time in Buenos Aires and Salta, but I haven't seen a lot of that. So, I still really want to go to Bolivia. I spent three months in Colombia, three months in Peru, only five weeks in Chile in the north in the salt flats, um, which is so stunning. And then two and a half months in Argentina. So South America is just so big and vast. I have a friend who lives in Brazil. I also want to go back there, but it's just like, I also love Colombia. I also want to eat in Peru. Like there's so many places that I want to go. But first, I'm going to announce this in Patreon first. I will tell you my plans because I bought the ticket. I am going to a country. I wanted to challenge myself to go to a country that doesn't speak Spanish. And that was totally different than I, like I would expect. So I think I'm going to spend six weeks, September or five weeks, September, 
uh, in a new place that will have totally different food. It's really going to challenge me. But I also have help there. So my goal is always not just to share with you my initial reactions to places, but also to be able to share information about food. So I'm already starting to set up. Andreas is not coming with me. Um, I'm already starting to set up uh, kind of, no one will replace Andreas just because we have such a good friendship, but to get support on the road to help me share the stories behind the food for you guys. Um, Brendan, what do you think of the violence and drug gang activity in and around Waiya Kills? So um, yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, Ecuador announced a state of exemption, exception. It's not a state of emergency, but it's basically like they are saying in the provinces of Esmeraldas, Manabi, and YS, which is where Guayaquil is, they have now the ability to do things that they wouldn't normally be able to do, like the police can. There are a lot of rules in Ecuador about, like, you can't just get stopped. You know, like, uh, people have a lot of human rights here that maybe they don't have in our home countries. And so right now in those three countries, um, there's three provinces, there are, uh, the police can do more. So, this happened before in Quito. I don't remember when it was, but I was in Quito when the police, you, they'll just randomly stop you and search your bags and stuff. So that's now allowed. And so the idea is um, they're trying to cut cut down on that. And I would say this is welcomed by Ecuadorians because this is activity coming from Peru to Colombia. So when we talk about violence... Like, it's really complicated. When we talk about gangs, this is like gangs from Mexico and gangs surrounding the drugs of getting the drugs from Peru to um, Colombia. We are not talking about Ecuadorian gangs. And so it's tough. Like, when that was announced on Twitter, if you're on Twitter, that's where you'll get all Ecuadorians are chatting a lot. It's all in Spanish, but you can kind of get. And Andreas usually spends a lot of time on there and then downloads the news for me um, into something that I can actually understand, putting it into context. So again, those are things that we can talk about on Patreon. Um, all of this knowledge that I have that like I would not share. Um, Ecuadorians really want that because they are seeing violence related to, that's not has nothing to do with them, that is really scaring people. And they are really worried. Like there's some things that are happening that it looks like it's Mexican gangs, like trying to, I don't know, expand or whatever, whatever they're doing. And so Ecuadorians are welcoming this. I would say in Guayaquil, it's very similar to Esmeraldas. You need to know what you're doing, where you're going. So a lot of people said to me, I can't believe you went to Esmeraldas. However, it is safe if you go to the right places. Why you kill the same? I really want to go to like some neighborhoods that have these crazy wakas with fantastic food. But those are not places where I should be. So the same for Manabi. For some reason, when people talk about violence, they don't really talk about the Manabi province. And I think it's because so many people retire there. But certainly in Man Manta, Salinas, like you see Sicarios, which are like hired gunmen. Um, and then on the Facebook groups, there are lots of videos of people getting shot and all of those kinds of things. Those people are involved with drugs. We're not really going to see any of that. So yeah, the other, I am flying out of Guayaquil, um, on June 1st. We are not going to spend any time shooting video there just because as Andreas says, it's hot there right now. So we're just gonna like let things cool down, which is really such a shame because there are some places I really wanted to go to, but we're going to wait until I'm back in the fall. Um, which sunscreen do I use? Oh, I think it's called La Roche. Oh, it's, um, it is like, a. am I'm, I'm going to Johnny ask me that question in the comments of this video. So I get back to you on that. And I will answer. However, I will say this. Like, here's another fun fact. In Ecuador, did you know, or in Cuenca, there are two pharmacies that are subsidized. So there are, like, the regular pharmacies, but then there are two. They don't advertise this, but, like, locals know it, which are subsidized. One is subsidized by, I think, the city of Cuenca, and the other is subsidized by, I don't know who. I would have to ask Andreas. So when I had to buy all of this expensive sun care, sun, sun care um, products, I saved $20 by him taking me to these places and they're right in the sun, like historic center. And they just look like these random sunscreen or pharmacies. So 
I will also share that on Patreon. <laughs> so there's just so much I can share with you guys. Um, and they had, it was just like a regular pharmacy, except everything was much cheaper. So what we did was we went to two pharmacies that are like the name brand ones and we wrote down the prices. And then we went to the other places to see if we could get a better deal. You do have to wait in line. That's the only thing. So if you see a pharmacy where there's like a big long line, that's probably because it's subsidized. Mm -mm. Oh, I love to see it when people are talking to each other on the chat because I don't know everything. And so I love Edison talking about Montevideo. I do know a lot of people love it. And Punta del Este. Yeah, I do know that. Maybe I could go there in November. Um, Bella Sofia. Hello, I'm so glad you're catching me live here. So Edison said, at, at this point, I'm more likely to try other places before I move around and settle down. Yeah, like I just think that, you know, there are places that I have loved that I think I love to visit, but maybe I wouldn't want to settle down there. And I think a lot of people come here and they're like, I'm coming here. I'm getting the permanent residency right away. I'm doing all of this. But I think there's something to say to about keeping your mind open. I love Ecuador. I really do. I love being here. I really want to support it. I want more people to come here to experience it, but it is not the right place for everyone. And so even when people ask me my favorite towns, oh, my mom, my mom. Oh, so if you look at Carmi Brogan, Johnny, my mom wrote, it's La Roche Santhera 3. It's $50 a bottle, but it lasts a really long time. And it's not like a thick sunscreen. It's like a fluid one. And so then um, the pharmacist also, or sorry, my dermatologist, she also recommend, recommended one for my body that was also like, it's like a thin liquid. So it doesn't make your face all white. Um, anyway, so what I'm saying is you could love being somewhere, but visiting and living, I don't know. It's just two different things. It's not for everyone. I travel a lot and I really embrace local food, local culture. And I think that's because I'm always trying to like to, to take it all in so I can express it on my website and now on YouTube. So it gives me motivation. But for some people, I think maybe this isn't the right place for you. Maybe you'd want to be in Mexico. Maybe you'd want to, Costa Rica is too expensive right now. Um, maybe you'd want to live in like Panama which I have not heard good things about, but I've been there, but I've heard retiring there isn't great, but who knows? Maybe it is great for you. So yes, I do believe you should visit, see other things, see other towns. A lot of people come here, they retire here and like they retire like in Manta and it's the only place that they've been or the only, once they get there, they don't go up and down the coast. So just get out and explore. That's why I share these videos is to just say to you like, hey, three hours away is somewhere really great. And you can find hotels for $20 a night. Um, Bella Sophia, have I seen tiny houses in Ecuador and Cuenca? So I have seen them as Airbnb rentals. I have not seen anyone living in them other than them just having tiny houses, but tiny houses that you're talking about. Yes. If you look on Airbnb, people are starting to do them. I've also noticed, oh, I can't remember where we are on the coast. People were starting to do, oh, people are starting to do really interesting things with those containers. Now they're probably getting more expensive because I've heard there's a shortage of those containers, but there's some interesting container kind of living going on. But if you go on Airbnb, you'll see it. Um, in Cuenca, in the historic area, no. So the historic area where I am, um, like you can't tear down a historic house and there's there's no room. On the outskirts, though, people are starting to do things. Um, Frederick Jones, oh, you're welcome. If you ever have any questions, please let me know. I'm happy to, I'm always kind of trying to improve and do things. So sometimes you'll notice in my videos, if I have, if I'm eating something, I always put the name of the food there because if I say it in Spanish, you might not know what that is. And so I'm trying to also connect the saying it in Spanish with my Canadian accent and what the name of the food is there. So the names of foods also become uh, more comfortable so that if you see it on a menu, you'll be like, oh yeah, I've seen like Bolon de Verde so many times. Um, Johnny, thank you so much. I would love to have you on Patreon. I am more than happy to help you with lots of questions and things. Um, 
Jean Pierre, when I will I be in Guayaquil next? You should try La Picanteria El Lechon for the Ensoboyado. What? I'm supposed to go to a picanteria for pork to try their ensoboyado? That is very tempting. I'm going to write that down. So we were going to go to Waikil, and I just, um, I don't think it's going to happen. So I have one costeria that I'm trying to secure because I think it would be interesting to share with people. If it doesn't come through, then I might spend a couple of days in Waikil. But I think after five, four weeks of traveling through the Amazon in central Ecuador, I might be tired. So we have a pretty aggressive schedule. We try to stay super organized. I know on the videos, it's like, oh, we're, we're enjoying the coast. We're having a great time. And we do try to do those things. So sometimes we just take like in um, Puerto Lopez, we just took a beach day and literally just had beer on the beach. And when people were selling things on the beach, we just ordered it. And that was the day. I did not shoot anything. It was glorious, but only because I already had uh, a Puerto Lopez video. Other, I actually did shoot in the night. I shouldn't say that. I did shoot a bunch of stuff. It's not going to be in a video, but I thought in some video someday, I'm going to share this on Patreon because there's this awesome hamburger place that we went to um, that's just a stall that's open at night. And it was so cool. And so I shot it on my phone. I'm going to put that up on Patreon this week. My mother said, what happened to pacing myself, guys? I am just like... It's hard. I I don't, I have so many things I want to share with you. And so I want to take time off, but I also want to share things. And I also get my energy from sharing things. There are so many times Andreas and I just like leave a meal or a business or like a place that was just like so cool. And we just have so much energy because we feel like sharing it. It's just like so good for the world. Like we're doing something positive. And so that's why I can't take a break just yet. When I go home in summer, in the summer, I'm going to try to take a break. Um, so, yes, Jean-Pierre, you know what? If you could, I would love all of your suggestions for why you kill. If in, this, in the video part of this, in the comments, if you could leave three places that you think I should eat at, when I come back here, I will fly into why kill and I will do why I kill first. Um... So, Reese, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Please, Ludo, please let me know if that's wrong. Um, I'm amazed how some people pack their lives into two suitcases and decide to start a new life in a place they've never been. We're planning one year to our top 10 cities and, and then decide. Yeah. Also, so I usually travel. I'm going to have a packing video. I usually travel with a 40 liter either backpack or suitcase. They're both from Eagle Creek. And one side of it, sadly, is like all my electronics to like live my life. And then usually I travel with seven dresses, like a pair of shorts, a pair of yoga pants and a sweater. And I've just learned along the way you can buy everything that you need. Like, for example, when I came here the first time, I didn't bring enough heavy clothes because I'm an idiot. And for some reason, even though I'd been here six times and Andreas kept telling me to bring warm clothes, I didn't bring any sweaters. So I bought this. This was $17. So you also learn you don't have to bring everything. Like Ecuador has major brands. They've got like Neutrogena, like high-end brands. You can buy things here. You don't need to bring like a whole thing of shampoo. You can just bring little shampoos. Anyway, just those kinds of things. So you actually learn you can live with not a lot. And then slowly you realize, like, I didn't use that, like, zip up sweater for, like, the last 10 months. So I'm just going to get rid of it. And for some reason, if I get really cold, you can just buy a new one. Johnny, I am full of energy. This is all coffee. And I'm half done. Wait till you have the coffee here. It's so good. Mm. Badva. Oh, your message got cut off, but I really do appreciate all your discussions, especially about cameras. Um, Bella Sofia, my Spanish accent is excellent. So Andreas corrects me a lot. Um, as I said, I would consider myself intermediate in Spanish, but the last two years in Cuba really was good in that it really helped me um, understand people who are difficult speakers. Like I find on the coast, it's harder to understand speakers. 
I also don't understand anyone from Venezuela. So if someone is speaking to me anywhere and I don't understand them, I immediately know they're from Venezuela. Like the guy who did my nails, um, you can tell sometimes by someone's face if they're from Venezuela, but sometimes you quite you can't. Um, I knew he wasn't Cuencano because there is a definite look. Anyway, but I also didn't understand him. So I was like, oh, he's from Venezuela. And so we had a great chat about what it was like for him to come here. Um, but Andreas corrects me a lot on my Spanish, which I really prefer. I just had a video from Pedernales where he didn't correct something I said. I said, um, arroz, instead of arroz de marisco, I think I said arroz de marisca. I don't know why I said that. And he didn't correct me. That's his fault. I'm going to, I haven't seen him yet today, but I'm going to tell him. People are going to make fun of me in the comments and it's his fault. So Carlos, how many months can you stay in Ecuador in one year? So right now you can stay um, three months on a tourist visa and then you get another three months that costs $144. And then you have to move to um, a temporary visa, which is what I did. Or what actually a lot of people do is they just overstay their visa and then they they pay a fine of $215 and then they can come back the next year. So I could have done that, to be honest. Um, I really did this nomad visa thing because I really wanted to help Ecuador and then it just like drained my bank account. So I feel like I was really dedicated to Ecuador and the government was not very dedicated to me. Um, but so you, you can spend six months a year. I actually think that Ecuador should, um, what they should do is make it so you have to renew your tourist visa every three months up to one year. Because I think at the one year mark, so $144 for someone coming from, uh, who has money, that's doable. Ecuador gets its money. But um, the next level up to go up to a temporary visa is like at least $1,000 when all is said and done. So to go from 144 to a thousand is a big jump at the six month mark. Maybe you don't know if you want to come back to Ecuador, like if you want to live here or what you want to do, but if you stay here for a year, you have a pretty good idea of if this is the right place for you. And so what a lot of people do is they hit the six month mark and then they leave. That's my advice for the government. I actually think I told the ministry of tourism that my contact there, but they don't have any say. So um, so is Patreon a channel within YouTube? No. So YouTube, I'm going to put, I'm actually going to link my Patreon right here. I can hit. Um, so oh, I can't comment in this chat for some reason. Oh, there we go. I'm going to pin this. So YouTube as it stands right now, doesn't, oh, let me try to pin this. <laughs> Technical difficulties replace pinned message. Okay. Oh, oh no. Oh no. <laughs> I hope I didn't screw this up. Okay. <laughs> Replaced. Okay, I think. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to screw this up. I think I pinned it. Anyway, so Patreon is to the side. So Patreon is a format that works with creators. So that could be travel creators. A lot of artists are there. A lot of like graphic designers. And what you do is you set the different levels. You set what you want to give, and they basically act as a being a, an outside platform where you can post things. But YouTube doesn't have that right now. And also YouTube takes a lot of money. So I think right now when you um, belong to like the membership and thing things, I think YouTube takes 30% or something like that. So for every dollar, they're taking 30 cents. Plus I'm Canadian, so I pay taxes on that. So at the end of the day, it becomes very expensive. Patreon has been a really well-established platform for YouTubers for that reason. Um, but there are lots of people who don't have YouTube channels. I know bloggers who are on it. And it's just an easy way to create a community because they have their own, um, like, I can put videos up on their photos. We can actually connect on there instead of on YouTube community. Um, but YouTube hasn't set anything up like that. I'm sure they will do it in the future. 
you might see on YouTube right now, like they'll have little membership things where you can, if you pay, I think like $1.99 a month, you can have like an asterisk or some kind of icon next to your name when you comment. And that's because when YouTubers get big, like they can't find the people because they've got thousands of comments. So that helps them prioritize it, which is great. I'm still small. And so I can see all of your comments. And I try to com like I try to reply to every comment two days a week um, when the videos go live. I try to comment right away. Um, but I'm constantly on my phone because I have YouTube studio where I can see your comments. So I try to comment as best as I can. And then I'm also on Facebook trying to also reply to people's comments there. I feel like Patreon is a place where I can dedicate more time, give you more. And then also when I share those things, everyone gets to see it. So maybe it's not a question that you've had about how to remove a mole, but maybe someday you're going to need to have a dermatologist. So that helps. Um, so yeah, so it's patreon.com slash Angelina, my name, and it's pinned at the top. So check it out. And if you've got feedback for me, if there's something you want to see, definitely let me know. Everyone that I know who does Patreon said to me, start simple, because you'll find that your community might want things that you didn't even think about, or maybe the things that you suggested they don't even want. So that, it's kind of a thing where it really is a community that we can figure out what you want and how I can supply it together. I try to provide things that I think are fun to start off, but then I have ideas for other things like the guides. But if there's only one person at a certain level and that's the one that has the guide, I don't want to spend like 40 hours creating a guide and it's only for one person. So those are the kinds of things we have to take into account that this is supposed to make things more valuable to concentrate my time um, but I really do want to make it two way. I really do want to help people because even in these lives, I feel like, um, they're great, but I only do them once a month. Uh, coffee question. Have you found a place where you can get your whole bean of fresh ground coffee? Kevin, absolutely. Coffee here is amazing. There are so many regions. Our favorite coffee is actually in Salango on the coast, but there are so many good places. If you're in Cuenca, Loja is just in Cuenca, there is a real coffee culture. Like, I don't think I've ever in Cuenca ever had instant coffee. Whereas on the coast, you really, you have, like, we travel with a coffee maker because unless in alone we had great coffee with Shane and Tanya. Um, but for the most part, nobody has coffee. So, but you can buy it. Not everyone suggests Super Maxi. That's garbage. So see, look, I have this strong opinion. On Facebook, people are like, oh yeah, you can get your coffee at Super Maxi. Don't do that. There are so many great coffee producers and shops that sell awesome coffee in Cuenca. There's like a place where um, we go to and that's what they do. They're coffee growers and then they sell the beans or they'll brown them for you right there. I will share that on Patreon. See? Um, why kill Cynthia? Why kill is so historic. Yes. There's so much to see. I am missing it. I've not been there in two years. I really want to spend more time in Guayaquil too. I also really feel like there are some places that I go that I don't share in videos because, because I'm with Andreas, it's like we could go there, but it would be hard for other people to go there. And you really got to be aware. I feel like it's like a more advanced kind of thing. And I do share some places where I do tell people like, you've got to drive here. Don't walk here. I, I'm only going to share places that I feel like people can go. Like if I weren't with Andreas, I would be able to go on my own. Because up until this time, all of these times that I visited Ecuador, it's always been on my own. So I take buses on my own. I go places on my own. And so I also have a good sense. I didn't go to Guayaquil at all. And so having gone with him, I now feel like, okay, yeah, you could do it. These places that I recommended are good, but even the best ceviche place that I shared, I did say to people, you have to get a taxi here. Like you can't just walk around. The neighborhood's not safe. The market is safe. The market is totally fine, but the neighborhood was not safe. Um, Badvar, how long was Q&A session last? I'm trying to, oh, we're at the two hour mark, I think. Okay, I'm going to wrap up the questions. Also, uh, Maria has some questions. So if you have any other questions, let it, let me know. I will try to make it succinct. I'm not that succinct. You guys have no idea how many times I take takes on my videos. Um, let's see. Ahmed, may the second extend double the price and the third three time it would be win-win for both sides. 
I don't know what that means. Shane and Tanya. Kevin is my second patron. Thank you so much. It's really exciting for me. And as I said, two-way street. I definitely want to know what everybody, like what the community is feeling like. I just really feel like I can be a better use to you. Um, Jeannie, I bought this in Cuenca. So this was $17 in Cuenca in one of the main squares. I think it's San Sebastian where I bought it. You can get this. I think originally they wanted $25. Um, you know, a lot of people go to Otavalo and they think it, like they call it the artisan market. It's not quite true. Like this wasn't handmade. A lot of the stuff in Otavalo now are machine made. Um, and you'll see if you spend enough time in Ecuador, you'll see the same designs everywhere. This one, I haven't seen as much. It has a pocket. Um, I have not seen this one as much, but you see the same kind of designs everywhere. I like vibrant things. If you watch my videos, I'm always trying to wear something vibrant. Um, which is hard to find because a lot of the artisanal things, this is not it, are like hand dyed with natural dyes. And so you get like pastel colors. I don't like that. I like the artisan part. I don't like the, the pastels. I don't look good in pastels. Um, Shane and Tanya are enjoying the coffee that I, yeah, that we gave them a couple of weeks ago. So that's from Salango on the coast. It is a place that um, not a lot of people know about. And everyone says Los Frailes uh, Beach outside of Puerto Lopez is the most beautiful beach. I prefer Salango. Um, and I will have a video coming up from there. It's from a um, tree house. And the owners who make that coffee also have a restaurant there that's awesome. I had a really great time there, except I did have a tour that was, I felt like it was a bit of a scam. And I do share that as well. Okay, I want to get to Maria and Pedro sent me questions in advance. So I'm going to do one from Maria, one from Pedro. So have I worked in a restaurant previously? Yes and no. So I, and have I worked in hotels or stadiums? Not, not hotels or stadiums, but I've worked in tourism because of my website for 12 years. So I feel like I've seen so many places around the world that I have a really good judgment of what's good, what's not. The same thing for Andreas because he has these, he has four different um, buildings uh, that are hostels, but are more like air, like B and B type things. We are very critical when we go places, um, and that's why I only share certain places. But um, in 2014, I owned a restaurant. So while I was traveling um, for my website, I met a chef. We fell in love. We opened the first restaurant in uh, Canada, funded by Kickstarter. And I wasn't supposed to work in the restaurant, but in before that, we had a pop-up restaurant in a dive bar for 11 months. I was the server. And then I was supposed to retire when we had the restaurant. But anybody who's had a restaurant knows that just doesn't happen. And that restaurant lasted two years. The relationship lasted shorter than that. I would never do it again. I love eating in restaurants, but they are terrible investments. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Maybe on Patreon. No, I can't. I, I don't feel uh, comfortable telling, like talking badly about an ex. So Pedro. Okay. So I did talk about, I did talk about VPNs. I did say stay here for a year. Don't think that it just because it's a, an expat that you can trust them. Oh, I did share my processor size. Oh, I think I answered all your questions, Pedro. Yes, so you can buy a replacement PC. Um, and Maria, I think I answered all your questions about my background. I did attend college. Um, my, I have a four-year degree in public relations. I majored in marketing, and then I worked at an ad agency for 10 years, or a number of ad agencies, um, actually, in Toronto. And then I took my career break, which... I ended up, you know, when I took a career break, I really had no idea it would turn into this. Like blogging was something you did as a hobby. I think because of my background in marketing and then also just I've always been like a writer and someone who shared a lot. And I think my website work where I shared a lot of personal things really has helped me in YouTube because I'm not afraid to share with you the good and the bad of me. And then I... You know, just I don't feel like I have to be perfect. 
I'm not. I'm just like one of you. I just happen to have a slightly different life. Um, so Maria wants to know, go to statements to politely decline unsolicited gringo invites. And her suggestions were hilarious. So she said, she wants to know if it would be rude to say, thanks, but I promised myself I would only surround myself with people who speak Spanish fluently for my first year. Or if you can and will agree to speak with me exclusively in Spanish, not bring along anyone unwilling to speak Spanish. C, I'm allergic to gringos. They complain too much. D, thanks, but honestly, I moved to Ecuador to, immer to immerse myself in the Ecuadorian culture. E, maybe on the 33rd of May. This is so funny. So I think... A is best and just be honest. So I do feel sometimes I'm worried that people in Cuenca will think that I'm antisocial just because I don't go to any of the gringo like hangout spots. Um, and it's just because it's not my thing. So I do have like a friend base here because of Andreas. And honestly, I'm so busy. It's been really, really busy. And so when we are here, Andreas is catching up with um, either he has guiding he needs to do or stuff with um, the accommodations here. And then I'm usually working with my editor or like sometimes I'm just exhausted. And I just honestly, I just watch YouTube all day. Like Sundays are my favorite day because I share the video with you on Saturday. And then on Sundays, like I catch up and just watch YouTube all day. <laughs> like I'm a heavy YouTube watcher. Um, I have met captured Joseph. I think he's great just because he is very much like me. Um, but I haven't even really seen him since I did the interview because I've just been shooting so much right now. We're trying to get the 21 videos done before I leave. And a lot of them are in Cuenca. But I just, I, I'm also organizing the upcoming trip. So I think for other people, you should just say like, I, I, I'm really trying to learn Spanish. So I'm only working in Spanish right now. So there are other people like that. There are actually a lot of awesome expats in, I mean, Cuenca is like the biggest expat city, but there are a lot of awesome expats that also speak Spanish, have been here for a long time that will, uh, would offer that to you. They have to me. So, um, and like a lot of expats who also want to do like cool cultural things and are trying to maybe get like four people together so you can get a guide and get a better deal. So I, I think you should just be honest. And there are a lot of expats here that don't want to learn Spanish and don't want to participate in any Ecuadorian culture and just want to have their life here, but cheaper than the U S. And so in a way it's kind of like you figure out who those people are right away. And if they think it's rude, well then maybe you wouldn't have been friends anyway. So. Oh, Bella Sophia, thank you so much for joining Patreon and DK Doyle. Thank you. You've got to run. I will definitely follow up with you guys. I'm going to go on the platform after this Reese. Wow, thank you so much. This really means a lot to me. Let's get through Maria's questions. <laughs> um, am I going to have anxiety about my next flight knowing most people will be maskless? So I don't stress about things before they happen. I do believe in wearing masks. In Nova Scotia, we were so lucky during COVID that we were actually COVID zero for a really long time because we had like crazy um, mask rules. And then also we... Uh, had a bubble where we wouldn't let other people in. And so in Ecuador, I thought kind of felt like it was a good place to go to because you had to wear masks inside, but also outside. And in Cuenca, everyone wears a mask. The only people I don't see wearing masks are um, expats or travelers. And so now that in the last couple of days, I don't know what's happening. I On Tuesday, they said they would decide what's going to happen in Cuenca if people were, will wear masks or not. I really thought they were just going to drop masks outside. I think in Cuenca, people still will, just like in Nova Scotia, where I'm from, like my mom still wears a mask. And so I can only control myself. So I'm not going to worry about it. When I fly, I'm definitely going to be double masked. Um, I am young enough and healthy enough. I don't think I will die from COVID. I, I know a lot of people who've gotten it and they've been fine. My sister's whole family got it. They were fine. But my biggest concern is I am self-employed and I have friends who've gotten that brain fog where... They are just, they can't work. And that would be devastating for me. So I am very concerned about that. I also, when I come home, you know, I'm going to be around my mother. I always wear masks here because I travel so much. I think I'm high risk to be around. I have tons of, I brought from Canada all of those home tests. And so 
Andreas and I actually tested ourselves before we came back to Cuenca. Like our concern is not so much about us, it's about infecting other people. So for me, it's just gonna be about the world can do what it wants and I will do what I want. And I'm not, I'm just gonna try not to stress about it because things are changing. Top five El Morzo spots in Cuenca. Video coming soon. Um, let's see. So, Carlos, can you really live from being a YouTuber? I do know people who live from being a YouTuber. So I live from being a blogger. And I've been doing, that's because I've been doing that for 12 years. And so I have built up a website that's really strong, has tons of content, very useful. Um, I, I know a lot of people who watch me on YouTube have never been to my website, Bacon is Magic. But there's lots of great like info there on Ecuador from all the times that I visited there. And I actually... Um, has started a lot of the videos that I share are from that content. Um, so yes, you can do it. My concern with YouTube is that one, the way to scale and to become a big YouTuber and make a living, you really, you've had to be doing it for a long time. And then also you have to kind of go to a lot of places and you have to do like the big stuff. Um, as I said, Middle East is hot right now. There are a lot of YouTubers in like Iraq, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Pakistan, lots of in Pakistan right now. It's become like a hot place to go and you get a lot of followers that way. I really, even though Ecuador doesn't have a big following, like not a, Ecuador I think is kind of like a niche place to go to. Um, I want to change that. I want more people to come here. And so I kind of take a hit on the revenue because I believe like it's fulfilling for me to share this. I don't, I don't need to go to Paris and tell you to go to Paris. Everybody knows that. So I am going to share, continue to share places that are a little bit different. I will take a hit on that. And I hope Patreon is a way to help me recoup some of that um, because I'm not just going to be like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to share all the places. Of course, I share popular places because people want my perspective, but you don't need to know like Paris, London, all of those. You already know they're awesome. So um, is so Milo is the pandemic not scandemic not over in Ecuador yet okay so Ecuador has been reportedly been doing really well they have a less than five percent positivity rate Nova Scotia was like that too before we got rid of masks so everybody has their own feelings my feeling is that masks work I am um, uh, vaccinated masks work. Not everybody is. And, um, a lot of people died actually in Waikil. Sorry, motorcycle going by way too fast. Uh, there were mass graves in Waikil. So Ecuadorians take it very seriously. And in Cuenca, they take it very seriously. So there's an aging population here. Um, and yeah, Michael Reed, a lot of people died here. Like Ecuadorians don't want that. That's why I'm really surprised that the government said they were going to announce um, just we didn't have to wear them outdoors, which would be fantastic. Um, I didn't wear them in Canada outdoors, but I'm really surprised they said indoors as well. So I'm just going to continue to wear a mask indoors. Ahmed, how did I learn Spanish? I live here in Cuenca. Mine is still bad. Ahmed, don't hang out. Like, you just have to get out with Spanish speakers. You just, you're going to be terrible. Um, I do, I think there's a language exchange program where you can go and just speak like I think you speak for half an hour in Spanish with um, an Ecuadorian and then you speak in English so they, they can also um, learn English the problem is in Cuenca too many people want to speak English to you I always speak in Spanish always even if someone speaks to me in English like I'll speak in Spanish and they'll realize oh like she's Canadian so let me make it easier for her but I continue to speak in Spanish always. So my only problem is Andreas, the person I speak to the most. We speak in English. We have been trying to get better at now speaking Spanish. Oh, look, there's spammer on my... I don't know if I can get rid of this guy. But there's a spammer if you want adult dating. That's never happened to me before. I guess, you know, you made it um, when... You get spammers. Michael Reed, I don't know what Biden told everyone at the White House press dinner. To be honest, I have had to like, I just do what I think is right. So I know everyone, including the president of Ecuador is like, the pandemic is over. The pandemic is not over. 
I do not want to get brain fog. I do not want to infect people. And so even if people think masks are a scam and don't work, which I think is crazy, it's not a big deal for me to wear a mask inside. So I am prepared for all the people who think I'm an idiot, like whatever, of all the things that I could possibly do. If wearing a mask is my biggest inconvenience, I'm I'm prepared to look silly to other people. Um, yeah, my Spanish teacher in Quito lost her dad to COVID. A lot of people died here. Um, and I think, you know, I, in Canada, we didn't get, especially in Nova Scotia, we didn't get the vaccine as quickly as other places. And so as the U.S. wasn't taking them and they were like going to expire, like we were all like, we will take those. I did get my third booster shot here. I am so thankful to Ecuador for their health care um, and that they would give it to me when I was just on a tourist visa. Yeah, best is to keep distance, wear masks in public and get vac vaccinated. I agree. Yeah. Um, Shane and Tanya, I wish you spammers soon too. I, I really think it's like you've hit a mark when you start to get the spammers. So, oh, so Biden told everyone to get where to get vaccinated and asked the Fox reporters where to go get vaxxed. That's good. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Of all the things I've ever had to do in life, wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, not a big deal. Yeah. Milo, I think I, I want to report the spammer, but... The, when I tried to pin my Patreon, uh, something weird happened. So I just feel like I don't, I, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to last question. So last three questions. If you've got three more questions, I can't believe you guys have stayed with me for two and a half hours. Um, I'm going to answer Maria's food, general food questions, and then I'm going to get to you. So she wanted to know, I love vegetables. I've actually found that in my life, one, I need to drink a lot of water. What a lot of people don't realize, I spend most of my day drinking like three liters of water and then trying to find a bathroom. So is there a vegetable I typically enjoy which you can't find in Ecuador? No. So I really thought about this, but Ecuador has tons of fruits and vegetables and so many that I haven't even thought about what I can't get because there's just so much. Um, Ecuador doesn't have a culture of eating big salads. And I mostly eat in Ecuadorian spots. So I do eat them at home. So as I said, when I'm in Cuenca, I'm usually like drinking lots of green juice, eating big salads. They also, if you buy, um, if you buy dressings, the selection is terrible here. Like even in Cuenca at the Super Maxi, which is kind of has a lot of stuff from home, like peanut butter and lots of other stuff. It's like ranch, some crappy ranch, some crappy like Caesar salad dressing and then like honey mustard or something. So either one, learn to make your own dressings, which is very easy, or you might want to bring your own. Have I seen jalapenos or serranos sold in Ecuador? I'm pretty sure I've seen serrano, uh, jalapenos. I'm not sure about serranos. Ecuador has hot peppers. I can't remember what they're called, but they do have hot peppers, um, especially along the coast. People do use them in their um, ají and hot sauce on the heat or a heat is hotter on the coast, but you can find it everywhere. In general, food here is not spicy, but markets will have them. How many avocados do I eat weekly while like on average? Half of one a day for breakfast if I'm not traveling. If I'm traveling, it depends on who gives avocado. Andreas measures a good restaurant by if they have avocado and where it's from. We love the coast because they always give great uh, avocados. Um, have you, have I ever had blood work performed in Ecuador after eating a local diet? Have you seen an improvement in your panel numbers? No, my situation is really different though, because I eat for work. And so, um, I do really try to eat healthily. And so like, for example, when I'm in Canada or when I'm not traveling, like I, even when I travel, like I bring all brand, which you can buy here. I bring all brand for breakfast. I have it with yogurt. Those are kind of two things. Um, I eat for health. I try to eat like at least seven portions of fruits and vegetables a day that are not starches. So, but when I'm traveling like along the coast and I'm sharing food with you, I've been eating a lot of plantain. I eat so much bologna in Esmeraldas. So, but that is not typical. That's like shooting schedule for me. Um, but 
I think why so many expats come here and they find their health gets better is because they're not eating processed foods. So processed food here is very expensive. So um, regular food, like unprocessed food, there's no tax. But in uh, Super Maxi and stuff, once you even frozen food, so even if it's just frozen, that's considered processed. And so there's tax on it. So when you go into restaurants and things, they, they never serve you processed like frozen foods or like frozen veggies because... Um, it's more expensive for them. So you're always eating um, like just raw, good food. Ecuadorians do eat too much rice. So um, that's not great for you. So I don't eat a lot of rice. And usually if I'm somewhere, unless I'm sharing it for video because I want to want you to see what a plate is like, I usually will ask for half rice, warn people that I don't like rice, no rice. I rarely eat rice. So it's very starch heavy on a lot of meals, especially traditional ones like um, seco, it's always two starches. So either yuca, rice, potato, rice, yuca, potato, oh, and then french fries. So those things aren't good. Um, World Rider. My oh, so good to see you. Oh, your friend died of COVID pre-vax. Wow. Yeah, like a lot of Cuenca um, really shut down. And when you I think Quincanos really remember that and also remember the fear of what happened in Waikil coming here. So the hospitals here weren't overloaded, but it was, it was here. And so people were just terrified. And so Ecuadorians really, I think have a very similar perspective about COVID as Nova Scotians. So I really hope on Tuesday, they just say we only have to wear masks inside, not outside, which I think is totally reasonable because there's so much outdoor space here. When we go for like, we go for walks every day. And when we're not around people, we do take our mask off. And you do see people like in Parque de la Madre, they're running and they're not wearing masks. But at the same time, people um, who are unmasked really like will go out of their way more than six feet to like run around you and things like that. So they do take it seriously, but running with a mask on, it's, it's not easy. So um, okay, last questions. Since I'm on a US dollar, are you seeing inflation out of control now? I don't think so. Um, prices, Ecuador is not cheap. So if you want to just live somewhere cheap, Colombia is probably a better place, but Ecuador is safer. It's just a different country. Um, but overall, I think Ecuador is probably pretty steady. It's I feel like it's Canada. It's like conservative, but steady. Um, Carlos wants to know, go to the winery. So there is a winery near Santa Elena. Give us your feedback. I'm going to do that in the fall. After my my whole camera debacle, um, we drove by the winery in Santa Elena. And then I think we were like in Waikil and Andreas was like, was so upset that he forgot about this, but we were trying to get my camera fixed. So we were trying to get to Waikil early enough to do it. And I didn't even get fixed. There's one in Santa Elena and I, there's one in the Waias province too. I have had some uh, Ecuadorian fruit wine was not good. <laughs> so I'm interested in the other wine. I'm actually surprised Ecuador does like, Outside Cuenca, you could have wine because the days here are quite hot um, and the evenings are cool. So I don't know why. I guess, but wine is on the list. I love wine. Rice, brown rice, available. Yes. Yeah. But not in restaurants. So Ecuadorians, um, like for example, brown rice, amaranth, quinoa, all of those things are available in health food stores. Um, they all grow here. A lot of it is exported, but you're not going to find it in a restaurant. So I just don't eat it. Like if I'm eating rice, it's is because I'm like really hungry for some reason. So usually I'll just ask for half rice and then the salad portion that they usually put are just like tomato and um, cucumber slices or cabbage. And so sometimes I'll ask if I can just have some more of that. Um, quinoa is from Ecuador and a healthy grain. Do we say that? Yes, it's not popular. So quinoa is historically a traditional food in Ecuador. But remember when they were saying like all of the North Americans were eating all the quinoa and there was none left for like people in the Andes? That wasn't true in Ecuador. They export all of it. So you can find it here, but you'll be eating it at home. You can't substitute it. It's like white rice or nothing. So I prefer like, I'll eat like, I love yuca and the potatoes here are amazing. They have so many different kinds of potatoes, but white rice is basically just sugar. So I, I don't usually eat it. Um, Milo. 
U.S. inflation figure is 8.6%. So, okay, I, I should say this. With the um, gas crisis right now, things are going up. So, yes, we are seeing hopefully what is a temporary shortage. But I don't think what's increasing here is at, to the extent as what we're seeing in other countries. But, yes, gas has increased here. And Ecuador sold, I think, all of its oil until 2025. So they're in a little bit of a crisis with that right now, too. They're probably in the worst they've been economically. So the government's going to have to figure that one out. Um, Ecuador inflation was 2.1% last year. Yeah, like Ecuador is a pretty stable country. All right. Any last questions? Let me know. If not, oh my goodness, you guys have been here for two. My computer, oh, just a second, is going to run out of power. I did not expect it to go for two and a half hours. I want to say thank you to all of you guys, all of you who have already joined Patreon. Thank you so much. Those of you who are interested in Patreon, um, the link is at the top, patreon.com slash Angelina. As I, as I said, I'm really open to feedback. I, I don't want this to be just a, like a, hey, give me money so I can travel. That's not it at all. As I shared with you, it, I, it's not like I'm off on holiday. I actually am um, while I'm working. <laughs> so um, it's been a little bit hectic for the last two months, and that was just because of my visa. Um, it delayed things so much. If I wanted to share enough video through the rest of the summer, I had to, uh, I, ha I have to shoot 21 in 30 days. So it will be hectic, but also such a pleasure to share with you guys the Amazon, Central Andes, and then hopefully Ahasuria um, in the YS province. So thank you all so much, and. I will have a new video on Wednesday. And so if you liked this Q&A, please uh, give it a thumbs up. And also if there are any questions that I didn't answer, leave a comment below. So I will answer the comments below, um, providing any more information you need. Have an awesome Sunday and you'll see me next week. Bye.